10, Mr. Cornwell and the no good, terrible, bad Christmas. I know it's still a little early to talk about Christmas, but I can't help it. I love the holidays. Plus, mainly my birthday's around the same time. But anyways, I digress. Christmas, however, in England for about 20 years was actually banned. Apparently in the 1600s, between 1644 and 1660, Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell, who at the time was considered an unelect prime minister, banned the celebration of the holiday season. His reasoning was due to the fact that he was a traditional and very strict Christian, a Puritan, who believed that the activities like dancing, music, and makeup were considered sinful. To Puritans, they believed that any act would deviate from God should be banned and punishable by all means. Of course, this decision didn't last very long as it caused such an uproar, people caused riots. The English didn't like it, but as for the Scottish, they didn't seem to care too much considering Christmas wasn't much of a celebration till 1958, just a few hundred years later. That's all. Number 9. Do you get deja vu? I know there's a term for this, when something happens in the past and it repeats. Is it deja vu? A coincidence? Hmm. Oh, a reoccurrence. But in this case, this didn't happen yet. So I'll say it's a premonition. A really weird coincidental premonition. When the Titanic sank, it marked a huge impact throughout the world and through time. The claimed unsinkable giant fell to the bottom of the ocean and claimed the lives of over 1,496 patrons of all social classes. Researchers found the cause due to the temperatures lowering and freezing causes the sea's surface to reflect like glass. Because of this, spotting the iceberg was difficult, and therefore causing the Titanic to collide. The thing is, we know much about this part of history, but the scary part is that there was a book called Futility, a book that seemingly and strangely foresaw the disaster. Released in 1898, just 14 years before the Titanic demise, the writer Morgan Robinson wrote the novel Futility, or The Wreck of the Titan, a book that tells the story of a fictional ship whose sinking resembles very similar similarities with the events that happened in 1912. Number 8. Prohibition We know a bit about Prohibition, the time where booze was considered illegal. This occurrence took place during the 1920s till the early 1930s, so roughly 10 years of being told to stay sober, which doesn't seem too bad. But for the folks who love a good ale in the evening, they didn't like the thought whatsoever. The reason Prohibition started was prior to the certification of the 18th Amendment, which the US Congress passed the Temporary Wartime Prohibition Act, which banned the sales of alcoholic content greater than 1.28%. This was so they could save grain for the war effort in World War I. But once the war ended, the US Senate proposed the act in 1919 and the country went dry a year later. Prohibition turned out to be a success in reducing liquor consumption, death rates, admission to state mental hospitals for alcoholic psychosis, and crime rate decreased quite a bit. However, that didn't stop people from wanting their drink. By 1925, there was over 30,000 to 100,000 speakeasies all over New York City alone. So then in 1926, the federal government funded and enforced the so-called Noble Experiment, which mandated adding poison, including methanol, to industrial alcohol as a way to discourage people from drinking. So then they released these barrels of alcohol that they had poisoned to make people sick. That's pretty messed up. Still, the people endured and they were able to get their alcohol back in 1933 when President Franklin Roosevelt signed the Colin Harrison Act, allowing beer and wine back on the shelves. Number 7. The Six Million Dollar Man The 1970s was a pretty interesting time in history, from the Vietnam War, Watergate, equal rights for women, and minorities, technology, fashion, and entertainment, all flourishing heavily at this time. And one time in Long Beach, California, a film crew was filming an episode of The Six Million Dollar Man, an American science fiction and action television series that ran from 1973 to 1978. As they were shooting at an amusement park funhouse location, a stagehand was moving what he thought was a prop wax figure on a noose. As he tried to take the prop wax figure down, the figure one arm fell off, revealing human flesh and bone underneath. After an autopsy, it was revealed to be Elmer J. McCurdy, an American bank and train robber who was killed in a shootout with the police after robbing a Katy train in Oklahoma in 1911. Dubbed as the bandit who wouldn't give up, his mummified body was actually on display in an Oklahoma funeral home and then became a fixture for a traveling carnival during the 1920s through the 1960s. The ownership changed frequently till his remains would end up at the Pike, the amusement park where they filmed The Six Million Dollar Man. The police were called that day and through the autopsy, his body was completely petrified, covered in wave and had been covered with layers of phosphorus paint. Some of his hair was still visible on the sides and the back of his head, while his ears, big toes, and fingers were missing. While observing his body, they noticed incisions from the original autopsy, which would then test to show positive for arsenic, which they would have used as a form of embalming fluid at the time. On April 22, 1977, a funeral was conducted for Elmer as he would finally lay to rest. But to make sure his body wouldn't get stolen, they actually had to pour two feet of concrete over his casket. Number 6. William McKinley's Red Carnation Flowers hold a lot of meanings, from sunflowers representing unwavering faith as they are associated with positivity and happiness, chrysanthemums meaning happiness and friendship, and carnations represent distinction and love. Colors and flowers also hold meanings as well for William McKinley. A red carnation doesn't just mean deep love and affection. To him, it was his ultimate good luck charm. 
Early in his political career, his opponent gave him a red carnation boutonniere to wear during the debate, which he eventually won and continued a string of good luck of winning of congressional elections where he served in the Ohio House of Representatives for 14 years. He saw this red carnation as his good luck charm, as he would wear one during all the election cycles and win every time. Even in his 1896 presidential campaign, he won, and after he would win, he would wear the carnation on his lapel at all times. He even kept a bouquet on them on his desk at the Oval Office and plucked them to gift to visitors. Aw, so nice. But during the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, he met a 12 year old girl named Myrtle Ledger who was there with her mother. His words to her was, I must give this flower to another little flower. And he gave away his lucky carnation. Literally minutes later, McKinley was shot twice by his assassin and died the following week. The Ohio General Assembly named the Scarlet Carnation the official state flower in his honor. Number five, Debbie Reynolds. Hollywood isn't shy from scandals or dirty secrets passed around the bend. From multiple marriages and divorces to sketchy behind the curtain secrets that are probably 100% illegal and inhumane. For Debbie Reynolds, she was once a beloved and still is a beloved actress. But unfortunately, this glamorous star was one of many who dealt with the horrors of set misbehaviors, emotional and physical injury, and all kinds of psychological damages. Especially by her co-star Gene Kelly on the set of Singing in the Rain. She writes in her 2013 memoir, Unsinkable, that how her professional co-star didn't want her in Singing in the Rain at all. The co-founder of MGM chose her to play Kathy, and so Gene couldn't do anything about it. But what he did do to Debbie was just absolutely unprofessional and disgusting. Not only would he come to rehearsals criticizing everything she did, nor give her any sense of security of encouragement, he was also a severe taskmaster, according to Debbie. She even noticed scenes where they would have to kiss or be intimate felt extremely invasive and a violation. Considering Gene Kelly was 20 years older to the back then 18 year old Debbie Reynolds, he must have been extremely intimidating to work with, let alone kind of gross to say the least. Debbie worked so hard on set that on one scene, the famous good morning dance number, that her shoes end up being soaked in blood. She was forced by doctors to be on bed rest for two days. With no dance experience as much as her co-stars, Debbie revered as one of the best. Still, as horrifying as it was, Debbie didn't hold anything against the actor after they spoke in the early 1970s. She still notes that he made her star, how at 18 he taught her early on how to dance, how to work really hard, and how to be dedicated. She also writes in her memoir, quote, Gene came to visit me on my first time on Broadway, and after the show backstage, he hugged me, told me how proud he was of me, and kissed me, with no tongue this time, and I was so moved and I cried, end quote. Additionally, Kelly later reflected and admitted he wasn't very nice to Debbie on Singing on the Rain, and he was still surprised that she still spoke to him. Not all Hollywood stories seem seemingly have a good relationship with co-stars as it is tedious and meticulous place to thrive in, but by golly did those who survived and endured. Number 4. Harriet Tubman and her chickens Harriet Tubman is best known today as a brave freedom fighter and abolitionist who fought against slavery in the United States. With the help of her abolitionist friends in the North, she also self-funded her heroic raids through her favorite and incredible skill, cooking. And as an undercover agent helping escaped enslaved people, she was also known to carry chickens with her. Once after buying two chickens at a market, she almost came face to face with a former slave owner, so she quickly released one of the chickens she was carrying and pretending to chase it, creating a large commotion that allowed her to slip away unnoticed, even though ironically everyone's eyes were on her. She used every tactic if it means looking normal in everyone else's eyes, and these tactics work. Even reading a newspaper as enslaved individuals, she even went as far as reading a newspaper as enslaved individuals would typically not be able to know how to read. Number three, Mozart and his weird obsessions. <sighs> Pirating music is illegal, as it steals the creativity and dedication of musicians. But did you know, in 1630, there was only one song played in the Sistine Chapel. The Vatican kept the composition of Misere, Me, Deus a secret and refused anyone to play it. Until 150 years later, roughly in 1771, a young 14 year old came waltzing in, heard the piece and described the whole thing by memory, and then also produced it. That musical genius was Mozart, and it was actually considered the first time pirated music was a thing. Mozart is also known as a famous musician from composing great famous works like the Requiem, Piano Sonata in a K333 third movement, and the Magic Flute, and so many more. But as, as he was obsessed with gambling, as he was with procrastinating and writing music, he was one of those guys. He wrote the Requiem in the morning in like 20 minutes. He was known as a prankster and a bit of an annoying guy to some, but he was nonetheless a genius. But he was also obsessed with butts. Yes, he just loved butts. If he heard that song by Sir Mix a lot, he would definitely ask for a collaboration. He went as far as writing a song called Lick Me Im Arsh, which I'm pretty sure you can guess is in translation, Lick Me in the Arse. And if you can imagine 30 school choir students singing this song, it, it seemed pretty funny to Mozart, despite it sounding very heavenly. Number two, North Korean's movie star. Everyone loves a good movie, and in 1978, a film buff and future North Korean dictator Kim Jong-il decided he wanted to make a really good movie. His goal was to gain global recognition for North Korea's film industry since he himself was frustrated with his own films he made in the early 70s. He could tell that in contrast to other world-renowned films, his was pretty much stiff and lifeless, so he went ahead and kidnapped South Korean actor Choi Eun-hee during her time in Hong Kong. She was taken to Nampo Harbor, North Korea on January 22, 1978, and was 
house in a luxury villa. She was toured around the city and then later given a private tutor who instructed her the life and achievements of Kim Il Sung. Kim Il Sung took her to the movies, operas, musicals, and parties, as well as asked her on her opinions on various films and respected her perspective. She had no idea, however, that she was also used as bait for her ex-husband, director Shin Sang Ok, five years later after her capture. Once she disappeared, Shin Sang Ok began looking for her in Hong Kong when he was also kidnapped. Not initially aware of the situation, he was finally reunited with his ex-wife at a party Kim Jong Il hosted. He kept him in North Korea for eight years, forcing them to make movies, including his own version of Godzilla, Polgasari. The pair would finally be able to escape in 1986 during a press conference in Vienna under the protection of the U.S. Embassy. Following their escape, Shin lived in the U.S. working in the film industry before returning home to South Korea. North Korea denies any part of the kidnap and claims the two openly and willingly defected to North Korea on their own. Number one, Major Henry Rathbone. A bit of a somber note, but the day that President Lincoln was assassinated, it shook the United States as much as it is traumatized those who were with him. See, the president attended the play Our American Cousin with two other patrons, Major Henry Rathbone and his fiancée Clara Harris. After Booth fired the shot, Rathbone tried to tackle him to the ground, but Booth was able to get free after slicing Rathbone in the arm with a dagger. Rathbone was never be able to let himself down of the events that occurred that evening, so much so that the memory and guilt overwhelmed him and feeling like he was personally responsible for letting Booth get away. In the years to come, he experienced a myriad of health issues from stomach ailments to heart palpitations. The stress was so extreme to the point where his mental health and mental state deteriorated. Sadly, on December 23rd, 1883, roughly 18 years after the assassination, he attacked and killed his now wife, Clara, and attempted to do the same to himself. He would then spend the rest of his life in a mental institution. Number 10, three fights in a funeral. This first point is still up for debate as many historians are still trying to confirm how this whole gladiator thing started, but one possible launching point for these bloody Olympics was a blood rite at funerals. They served as a kind of violent eulogy, so instead of standing up in front of the mourning families and reading, I don't know, like a haiku or a poem, they uh, fought out their feelings. Healthy. When esteemed aristocrats died, families would hold bouts between slaves beside the grave. Like right there, front row seat for the corpse. This was to demonstrate the virtues that were demonstrated by the dead in life. This presentation of blood in battle also could have stood in for human sacrifice. As you can guess, the tradition would gather quite the crowd and eventually evolved into the epic gladiator battles we know today. Julius Caesar, for instance, organized a massive gladiator fight between hundreds of warriors to honor the death of his father. By the end of the first century BC, the gladiator games were state funded and much, much larger. Number nine, no heckling. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat, they would pour in. The energy was high. This was their only source of entertainment, really. They weren't watching The Witcher season two back then, so you know, they had to do this. So some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle. Well, just like a comedy show, they too can hear you heckle. You're throwing off their entire performance and that's a no-go. Today, a 21-year-old usher will politely ask you to keep it down, but in Roman Colosseum days, you don't get a warning. One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, was pretty die-hard when it came to the Colosseum and the games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd heckled a gladiator, probably talked smack about his oiled up abs, or, you know, smile. That's always a fun one, we hear that a lot. So Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena where a group of aggressive dogs finished him off. How terrifying is that? No heckling, ever, even now, stop. Hey Taylor, yeah? stop. <laughs> Number eight, vegetarians. So believe it or not, the diet of a gladiator was largely vegetarian, though it wasn't really like they had any choice. It was expensive to keep these fearsome warriors and meat wasn't always easy to come by, so they had to fill in the gap with other sources. Based on the excavation of 22 gladiators, their bones revealed that their typical food was wheat, barley, and beans. How they could tell this from their bones, no idea. Science, man. There was little sign of any meat or even dairy as well. However, they did drink another kind of mysterious substance. This study was carried out by the Medical University of Vienna in Austria and the University of Bern in Switzerland. And not only did it reveal the aforementioned vegetarian diets, it also showed evidence that they consumed a health boosting tonic made out of plant ashes. It can be compared to the way we consume magnesium tablets or vitamin C. It was believed that it helped restore gladiators after a battle. Now, obviously, 22 is a pretty small sample size, but hey, that's still at least that percentage, so. Number seven, death before combat. 
With most of these Roman gladiators, they are trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired off with an opponent that's somewhat equal. But not all of these gladiators are UFC fighters. Not all of them are Russell Crowe, okay? A great amount of gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment. These prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger. They understood that this was probably a one-way trip, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even began. This one story is haunting, but it makes total sense. 29 prisoners were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all ended up strangling each other. They took each other's lives because that was easier to them than walking into this night Nightmare. That's horrible. The reason this was an easier choice to make was because saying no would lead to an even more painful and still public execution. Number six, aphrodisiac. The fanaticism around gladiator warriors was like the fanfare around the Beatles, the Stones, and Justin Bieber, like all around, all combined. You might even argue that they were some of the very first celebrities, and that was mostly due to their sex appeal. They were sex moms. Ooh, ooh. Beefy men. Yeah. Roman women believed that even their sweat was an aphrodisiac, like Old Spice deodorant. The gladiators won massive fame and even had their own action figures as children would make their clay dolls emanating their favorites. Their image would be placed on walls in public spaces and even endorsed products. Women wore hair jewelry dipped in gladiator blood or mixed their sweat into hair cream or cosmetics. To have a dream about one was said to foretell a fortunate marriage. There was even graffiti in Pompeii that depicted one fighter who would catch women in his nets at night. Like a sexy boogeyman. Ooh. Number five, blindfolded. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn blindfolds himself and then still wins somehow? What a moment in time. There were no dry eyes in the entire theater. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull this trick off? Yeah, in order to get crowds to return to these massive death events, they would need to change the formula up from time to time. Sometimes they would have cheap beer nights, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada, where gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. They would also leave the armor inside. Yeah, sometimes just battling in sandals and cloth. And you thought Marco Polo made you anxious? Mm. They would save these events for the more brutal criminals, so people weren't just forced to, you know, wrap up their eyes and shake their legs into an arena. It was, you know, they were bad, so it's kind of like, mm, it was fine, I guess. Number four, women fought as gladiators. This was news to me. I wouldn't do it because tiny. Uh, as we might have already established, gladiators were usually built from slaves, warriors, and sometimes even volunteers. Good for you. And apparently women were not exempt from that. Female slaves were quite frequently condemned to face their fate in the arena, though some volunteered because, you know, there were Xena warriors. Some of the time it was as genuine contenders, while some were sent simply for the entertainment or embarrassment. Emperor Domitian, for example, loved to pit women against people with dwarfism because he thought it was funny. Neither the women or the little people were taken seriously, as few appeared to have proven themselves in combat. However, some still did, rest assured. The timeline as to when they started doing this is unclear, but there are records of at least two women referred to as Amazon and Achillea. Epic names, right? Whoa. They are depicted on a marble relief dating back to the second century AD, and it says that they fought in an honorable draw. Women also joined in the animal hunts, but by 200 AD, their participation ended when Emperor Septimus Severus banned them in the games. Damn you, Severus Snape. Number three, nets for weapons. When you're walking into that arena, you're eyeing down this eight foot six beast in front of you. He has like 12 abs. It doesn't look good. His name's Gore or something terrifying. You're gonna want a nerf bat or two. You're gonna want a weapon. Now, weapons in the Colosseum were a necessity, of course, but can you believe some gladiators would use nets to fight? Nets. Oh. Yes. Yeah, nets, like they're catching butterflies or co-hosts. This class was referred to as the Ritari. Now their combat style was built around the ways of fishermen. Yeah, Popeye versus Maximus, place your bets, people. Realistically, these warriors looked a lot more like Aquaman. They would fight with a trident and a net. They would take their time. They would avoid these mighty swings from these big dudes. And then when the time was right, they would just go Zzz! and then they would just poke the shit out of them with a the trident over and over in hopes that it would, you know, end. It helps to be quick, but if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know that spears don't always work. Number two, are you not entertained? Great title, I know. Fun fact, gladiators for the most part didn't actually try and kill each other in the ring, just like wound. Yeah, 
Take a second to digest that beside the Hollywood movies you know and love. But the truth was, gladiators had a code they had to follow, and killing each other wasn't a part of it. Why? Well, because gladiators were expensive investments, and seeing your prize fighter that you've like forked hundreds and thousands of dollars into die in a fight would hurt your wallet big time. Also, most of them knew each other and were besties, so they didn't even want to. Contests were usually single combat between two even opponents, and referees oversaw the whole thing. If one got injured enough, the ref would probably just, you know, call it. Often enough, the bout would end after both participants gave an entertaining show and would leave with honor. They were like, yeah, you're entertained. Good, we're good to go, right? Cool. However, their life expectancy was still short. Historians estimate that gladiators had 1 in 5 or 1 in 10 chance of ending up dead after the bout, either from being killed or wounded, gangrene, you know the whole deal. And finally, coming in at number one spot, naval battles. Okay, so I mentioned the Aquaman gladiators with the nets and the you know pokey poke tridents. That's absolutely insane. But have you heard about the staged naval battles? What a spectacle this would have been. The Colosseum was once flooded, which I'm sure took a hot minute or two. Then these ships would come out, and then it would be like medieval times, but with a splash zone, right? These ships were designed to resemble these vessels from famous battles, but the bottom of the ship was flat because the water was only five feet deep. Can't have the bottom of the ship scraping against all that sand and bones and stuff. No, you'll get stuck. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use real ships. It wasn't always violent reenactments either. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and nude synchronized swimmers would come out. Nice, nothing like an in-ground pool filled with gladiator bones. Also, goggles weren't invented until the 14th century, so yuck. These naval battles were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them. It's kind of like Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. They would just go to this lake and then watch these insane battles or performances, you know? Hashtags. Slytherin, I don't know. Once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the floodgates and trapdoors to hide animals inside of. Number 10, history. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka the Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes, and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16-year-old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana, and she also created a new religion. So, how's that? She ruled over what's considered the wealth wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshepput, because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache, so I kind of want to fake one myself. Lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth, though, recently in 2015, when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdou El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains, perhaps, the sarcophagus of the Lost Queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first, we need to talk about her modern-day origins. Number eight. Berlin bust. Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum a little piece of Egypt 
Egypt, all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, that's like 4K Egypt. It's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head, like that's really? But three years later, officials decided to release that to the public, so here it is, take a look. The Queen Nefertiti, 3D bust, scanned by James Bond secretly. Number seven, Monuments Men. It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. I had to, I had to, why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered. A totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in Germans' hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with the little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So, thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the Monuments Men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold Gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After after radar tests were conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasure, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. Number five, original plans. Another theory that surrounds the queen is that King Tut's chamber was actually meant for her. Yeah, listen to this. The former antiquities minister doesn't believe this. He strongly stands by his belief that the lost queen was one of the female mummies found in the Valley of the Kings. What's compelling here though is that King Tut passed away at age 19. So many believe his own burial chamber hadn't even been built yet, or finished at least. So instead, they used hers. But a radar survey around the tomb of the Valley of the Kings shows us this hidden chamber behind the north wall of the burial chamber. It's been said before that King Tut's chamber was way too small and there must be more. His stepmom being buried in the same tomb, well, that's certainly a start. We're on to something. Number four, tomb alignment. Nobody knows angles like ancient Egyptians. The way they built the pyramids, I mean, they still stand today confidently. We're trying to figure out just how they made the pyramids in the first place. Meanwhile, there's a team inside the pyramids trying to figure out who is even buried in the walls. It's a whole fascinating mystery. Using ground penetrating radar, researchers were able to find this corridor, this log opening in the bedrock at the exact same depth of King Tut's chamber. And on top of that, these openings are facing the same direction. Tomb KV-62 and this new chamber have the same orientation, so of course we're going to believe that they're connected. Because unconnected tombs don't often align, or don't ever align really, so that's also a sign. We're getting close. Let's just give me a shovel. I'll get in there. I'll help out. Be so gentle with everything. I'll feather things off. I've seen national treasure. Number three, brief ruling. The queen was the stepmother of King Tut. Her daughter was married to King Tut. So there's a handful of Egyptologists that believe that right before King Tut's ruling in the 14th century, there was this really small window where Nefertiti ruled as Pharaoh. There's also a great deal of historians that believe Nefertiti was no ruler to her husband, King Akhenaten, but we don't have enough evidence quite yet to really know what happened. Hence why we're doing a mystery video on the long lost queen. Now we get it. The reason we're adamant on finding everything we can is because she literally changed Egyptian religion. Number two her family. The queen's name translates to a beautiful woman has come. And given the fact that we still don't know her parentage, we have to use our national treasure brains here. A beautiful woman has come. Come from where? Well, early Egyptologists believed that Queen Nefertiti came from Syria. 
Back then, it was Mitanni. Her family roots are still debatable, but there's reason to believe that Nefertiti was actually Egyptian born. In fact, many believe she's related to King Akhenaten. We don't really know. The lost queen did have children of her own. She had six daughters, like I mentioned before, two of which became queens of Egypt. She may have also been the daughter of A, who at the time was an advisor for the king and ended up becoming pharaoh after King Tut's death in 1323. So we have no idea, but we're getting so close. I feel like we're like years away from finding everything we need to know, but also, this last point is pretty interesting. Number one, sun god origins. Okay, one of the most interesting facts about all of this was the religious impact that the queen made on ancient Egypt. Both her and King Akhenaten were in a cult. How fascinating is that? They were in the cult of the sun god Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time. There have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Theban tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, so definitely her, part of these sun god rituals. So cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. She made a new god. She convinced everyone to believe in a new god. That's incredible. We can't even decide on who's gonna win America's Got Talent. She's like trading in traditions and religions. That's wild. Got kicking off the list at number 10, boiling. Whenever I get in a bath that's too hot, I think of the medieval times. I can't help it. I can't believe this was once a real thing. I get chills thinking about it. Either water or oil would be used for this ancient punishment. To die by being boiled, that was reserved for those who poisoned others. So if you have any vials of poison, toss it. Don't do it, man. Trust me. In 1531, the time King Henry VIII was running the show, they made boiling a capital punishment. So poisoning somebody back then was equal to treason. Therefore, it was agreed you should be boiled slowly in front of like a room full of people. I would say that's the worst, but I know what's also to come on this list. Number nine, water. Taking a step away from the worst physical thing one could possibly go through, let's take a look at how far the mind will go before it too breaks. Sensory deprivation is still around today. In fact, there's many who pay for it. Yeah, they lie in a dark tub full of salt, then they float and listen to Childish Gambino. It's a magical experience. Your senses are powerful, especially combined with water. So this dripping machine, this old water punishment, that was just all bad. You had ice cold water dripping on your forehead and your face over and over for hours and hours. Drops would be at different random times so you can predict it as well. My toes are wiggling while I'm talking about this. This is making me anxious right now. In medieval times, they would tie you down and then using a horn, a big ass funnel, they would pour nine pints of water down into your, down your, down your throat. So water is horrible in many ways. Number eight, fire. Can't talk about medieval punishments without mentioning this witchy classic. Commonly practiced in Babylonia and ancient Israel, then later on in Europe with the classic witch hunts, burning at the stake didn't come from churches, like many believe. They didn't call the shots there at all. That was mainly how small towns settled local beef. Yeah, by burning at the stake, instead of just like a fist fight at the park. Burning at the stake came in full swing way back in 1431 in France. French disbelievers like Joan of Arc, they were burned at the stake. It was crazy that they actually did this as a form of punishment. This is one of the worst medieval punishments. And believe me, there's a little bit of a silver lining here. It was quicker than most. Sometimes. Gunpowder was sometimes used so that the burning and stuff would be much faster and brighter and louder and much more horrible. A lot worse on paper, but a lot faster. So honestly, I think it's better. History is insane. Another red hot punishment used in medieval times was when the accused had to hold a red hot iron bar and then walk a few steps with it. A red hot iron bar, your hands were literally toast at that point. Here's where it gets even worse though. Three days later, the accused would come back to the court and then when the bandages were removed, if their hands were healing, they started to heal, they were deemed innocent. They were on the path to goodness and whatever. If their hands were still in horrible condition from say, I don't know, holding a red hot iron bar, then they were pronounced guilty. That's how the courts worked back then. Number seven, the rack. Onto something not so hot and fast, but rather dull and slow, the rack is surprisingly well known. It was originally introduced to the Tower of London around 1420. The Duke of Exeter referred to this device as his daughter. What a weirdo. It's like guys who call their car like she. It's like, okay, just a little bit too close to your automobile, man. Relax. It was an open bed frame type device where your ankles were tied at the bottom and your hands were tied at the top. Already we're off to a horrible start. It was horizontal as well and sometimes it was up. It was, it was all bad. They would just leave you hanging by these ropes and these ropes were slowly tightened more and more, obviously causing some problems to muscles and joints that were, you know, holding things in place. This was done to extract information. This is also one of the worst things I've heard. 
Even getting tickled like this would be horrible. I couldn't even imagine. I make jokes because I'm uncomfortable. Honestly, hit that thumbs up to spread some good vibes because we're not even halfway done, folks. Number six, molten metal. This was another form of capital punishment, and if you've seen Game of Thrones, it'll ring a familiar bell. A few of these do, actually, yikes. Metal would be heated up in a cauldron for a long, long time to the point where it was liquid, it was molten metal, just a soup of minerals. Look, we said this video wasn't for the faint-hearted, and here at Bumblebee, we like to keep that promise. They would then pour the molten metal on your head, or more commonly known, this would they pour it down the throat of the accused. Obviously, it wasn't done as a method to extract information, it was done to brutally end someone's life. Because they're not talking after that, of course. Execution by molten metal was supposedly done to a wealthy Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, back in ancient times. The metal would burn your muscles and skin, literally cooking it, and then after a few moments, it would harden. Bad, bad, not good. Number five. Keel hauling. Not to be confused with Kegels, keel hauling was reserved for the worst of the worst at sea. This was used by pirates for sailors who disobeyed orders and all that jazz. The victim would be suspended by a rope with rocks or weights around their ankles, then they're lowered to the keel of the ship where all the sharp barnacles live. After so long, these ships are so old, it's just piled on layers and layers of barnacles. Then they would get dragged all along them with the water and Everything. Water plus pain, it's a lot. It's a deadly combination. Anything to do with barnacles in the sea, no chance. I'll literally tell you anything, Blackbeard. Anything. Number four, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society, but it can truly be one of the worst punishments out there because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. We were all just in a pandemic for so long. We got so bored and we had Netflix and iPads and I whatevers. I can't even imagine this back in the day. Basically, it's a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no contact with anybody else. Not even like a guard or anything rattling keys like in the old times. It was just nothing. No one would even check on them. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long they forget about their families. And some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they just forget how to speak, really. They forget how to be a human and interact in the real world. Solitary confinement and the negative effects that it has on a person is becoming a wider topic of conversation because of the effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was literally just a room made of stones. It was pitch black, freezing cold, you were tucked away below some janky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. In the dark, nibbling away your little piggies were number three rats another game of thrones classic if you're a rat person i know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their pet rat that's cool but maybe cover stuart little's eyes for this one rats as a medieval punishment where do i even start okay this one was a punishment for the rats at the same time what was once called a rat trap involved a man or woman being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped down to their chest or their stomach now inside this metal enclosure there's rats which are also just loose walking around and the person can feel them the little feet walking around in their skin and this is when the person and still in the punishment begins heating the other end of the metal enclosure historically it was hot coals that were usually placed on top or there's a fire underneath which quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside from there the rats begin frantically searching for a way out but because it's made of metal and they can't bite through that they find your skin and then that they can obviously bite through so you can paint the picture in your head it's disgusting Number two, the breaking wheel. The breaking wheel is literally just a large disc, a pirate ship wheel almost, just lying there, where somebody is then tied to it, and everybody else just hammers them and beats the shit out of them over and over. But of course, since we're talking about medieval times, everything has to be a show and whatnot, so once the accused was beaten and then presumed dead, the wheel would lift up and turn just to show everybody what's up. Another way to use the breaking wheel, yep, there was more than one, again, creative folks back then, they would tie a person to the wheel and then continue to rotate it and then all the ropes below would get tighter and tighter and twist. Kind of like the rack, but with a literal twist. And finally coming in at number one, the brazen bull. This one takes the rat's problem and then makes it a you problem. Out of all the ones on this list, the brazen bull is the last one that I would do. Straight up haunting. It's also been referred to as a Sicilian bull, and basically, it's not too complex. There is a bronze sculpture, often in the shape of, you guessed it, a bull. But in medieval times, it was just a big, closed cauldron. And usually, it was large enough to fit a person inside. Yeah, this was in a Saw movie, too, I believe. That's how you know it's a good one, when it's in the movie Saw. So once the person was locked inside or it was leaned over so they couldn't get out, a fire would then be set underneath this bull, and then you can probably figure out the rest in your head. They would even engineer the bull so that when somebody screamed, it sounded like a bull's roar. 
How fun is that? How fun is history? I'm learning so much about history that's fun on Bumblebee. And I hope you are too. If a part two is in your deepest desires, hit that thumbs up and I'll come back and throw up a few times and. At number 10, cutting fingernails. Each civilization had their own specific beliefs, religions, and rites. For the Vikings, their belief in Norse mythology impacted a lot of their daily lives and even their burial rituals. One specific prophecy from their religion depicted the end of the world, and as anyone would, they tried to avoid that at all costs. In Norse mythology, Ragnarok was their version of the end of the world, and during this event, it was foretold that a lot of stuff was going to happen, like giants and demons approaching and attacking the gods, and a ship called Nagfar would carry a fleet of giants. This ship was said to be made of the fingernails and toenails of the dead, and the bigger the ship, the more giants would come. Out of fear of this happening, the Vikings took every precaution to prevent Ragnarok and subsequently the arrival of this fingernail ship. To do this, the Vikings built into their burial rites a very important step, cutting the fingernails of the dead. The Vikings had to remove the fingernails of the dead so that they couldn't be used to build the giant ship, but other than their removal, no one really knows what they did with said fingernails. The Vikings were also said to have kept their own fingernails clean as to prevent the same outcome. At number 9, teeth filing. Many civilizations had body modifications as part of their culture through time. Mesoamerican civilizations were known to shape their skulls and alter their eyes, women in China altered the shapes of their feet for many years, and so many cultures around the world adorned themselves with tattoos, piercings, and scarifications. In Viking culture, their body modifications often included dental work. Evidence suggests that some Vikings filed horizontal lines into their teeth and some of them filled those grooves with red dye to make themselves look even more terrifying. Because the Vikings were known to be voyagers traveling the seas to new lands, some anthropologists believe that the Vikings may have picked up their idea for dental modification after making contact with people in West Africa as many tribes over there were known to file their teeth into different shapes. Would you guys ever do something like this or would you rather leave that up to the Vikings? Now before I continue telling you guys about the weird and crazy things that the Vikings did, let me first ask you guys to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe also consider subscribing to the channel to see more awesome videos like this one. At number 8, Carbon Monoxide. The Vikings were pretty good builders, mainly of ships. Their ships were huge, intricate, and very impressive, but where they excelled in shipbuilding, they lacked in the construction of their homes and community buildings. Apparently, the longhouses that they built for their communities were actually pretty unsafe to be in and trapped a lot of toxic gases inside of them. Researchers from a university in Denmark recreated one of the Vikings' longhouses and lit a fire in the center of it, like the Vikings would have done back in the day. After simulating an average living environment and monitoring the atmosphere inside of the longhouse, they realized that there wasn't enough ventilation to prevent carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide from building up inside. This would have led to a lot of people getting sick, especially those who spent long periods of time inside. The Vikings didn't know that though, but they also had their own remedies for curing sickness, so I don't think that they would have thought much of it. At number 7, Onion Soup. Speaking of Viking home remedies though, they had some pretty interesting ones. Every civilization had their own takes on medicine and healing their sick and injured, and the Vikings were no doubt the same. For them though, soup was their tool for healing, and for x-rays. Sort of. These days we eat soup when we're sick to warm up our bodies and balance out our sodium levels, and doctors have actually proven that eating chicken soup actually does make you feel better when you have a cold, but Vikings didn't really have the same idea. For them, onion soup was their thing, and they used it to diagnose people. Viking healers would make up a pot of really strong onion soup and feed it to a warrior who had a wound around their abdomen. Once the person drank the soup, the healer would see if they could smell the soup through the wound. If he could, then the wound was fatal and there was no sense in trying to save the person, so they would just move on to the next warrior. It saved the healer time trying to attend to everyone, but it kind of sucked for the person who got left behind, because not only are they not going to make it, but their last meal was that awful onion soup. At number 6, Blood Eagle. We all know that the Vikings were a ruthless group of people, but their methods of execution really painted a clear picture of how terrifying these guys were, and how they had a colorful imagination when it came to imagining new ways to unalive somebody. The Vikings came up with a method of execution called the Blood Eagle, and yes, it is just as terrifying as you would expect with a name like that. The Blood Eagle basically involved cutting someone up to make it look like an eagle. They would cut apart the rib cage and then spread it apart to make it look like wings, and then after that, while this person was still alive, mind you, they would pour a salt solution over the wound, 
pull out the lungs and arrange them over the rib cage to, again, make it look like wings so that this person could flutter away into the afterlife. Now the mysterious part of all this is that historians aren't exactly sure if this was actually a real method of execution or if it was just embellished in Viking records to make them sound cooler. I for one hope that it wasn't actually real because that sounds brutal, but when it comes to Vikings, you never really know. At number 5, building fires. The Vikings were some pretty innovative people, but they were also kinda gross. This gross behavior applied to a lot of things, but one of those things was their fire building. Now you're probably asking yourself, Bree, what's so gross about making a fire? Well, it's the way that they started the fire that was kinda grody. You see, nowadays we have a bunch of things that we can use to start a fire. We have matches, lighters, lighter fluid, and a bunch of other things. But obviously back in the days of the Vikings, they didn't have those fire starting tools, and so they had to improvise. The Vikings came up with a nifty little trick to start a fire where they took a fungus called touchwood and they would beat it and burn it until it turned into a thin flat thing that kind of looked like felt. Then they decided to get gross and would then boil the touchwood in human urine because urine contains sodium nitrate which would help the touchwood turn into something that would smolder rather than burn. They could then take this stuff with them and use it to start fires whenever they wanted so they could cook food over their urine fueled fire. Sounds delightful. At number 4, conning. Conning people has been something that's kind of been part of many societies since probably the dawn of civilization. Anyone can con anyone into doing anything or buying anything. I mean, people do it on eBay all the time. But apparently, the Vikings were also known to con people probably for their own enjoyment, because they're Vikings. Back in the day, the Vikings would do trades with the Inuit people and they would acquire narwhal tusks from them. The Vikings would then sell those tusks to other people, marketing them as unicorn horns, and let's face it, no one's gonna turn down buying a unicorn horn. Because of the Vikings and their conning ways, by the Middle Ages, people not only believed that unicorns were actually real, but that they also had magical powers. So in a way, if you were obsessed with unicorns as a kid, you can thank the Vikings for that. At number 3, house bears. Humans seem to be pretty good at domesticating animals. We domesticated dogs by accident and now they're considered man's best friend. We domesticated livestock for food and other purposes. We domesticated horses to be our transportation and carry things. So we kind of know our way around animals and could probably make anything into our pet if we really wanted to. But the Vikings weren't just satisfied with dogs, horses, and livestock. They were the mighty Vikings and they needed mighty pets, and that's why they kept bears as their companions. Yes, bears. Now don't get me wrong, the Vikings also had normal pets like dogs and cats, and they would even sometimes bring them along on their expeditions, but they also really liked bears. It is said that when they weren't out laying siege to someone's town or sailing the seas, the Vikings would visit bear dens and take bear cubs home with them. They would then raise the cubs as house bears. But having a house bear was also a very big responsibility. You had to make sure that your bear was kept in check at all times, so that meant no eating people or livestock, no disturbing your neighbors, and if your bear did get into trouble, you would either get hit with a fine or be banned from having a house bear. So maybe it's best to stick with normal pets like dogs. At number 2, worthy kids. The Vikings were ruthless even when it came to their spawn. I mean their kids. These guys were really picky when it came to having a family because they weren't afraid to just yeet their kids if they didn't like them enough. Back in their day when a baby was born, they would christen their kid with a name during a ceremony called Asavatni, but only after determining if this kid was even worth raising in the first place. You see, when a baby was delivered, the child would be placed on the ground for the father to then pick up and examine. He would be looking for any physical deformities, disabilities, and to determine if the kid was actually his or not. He would decide if the kid had a future. If they did, then they would hold the Asavatni ceremony where water was sprinkled on the kid's head and given a name, and if they weren't worth Worthy, then they would be left outside in the element and abandoned. And finally at number one, criminal profiling. It turns out that the Vikings kind of invented criminal profiling. You see, when the Viking horde would set off to battle, there was no telling how they would return. You have to remember that these guys were bloodthirsty and violent and there was no telling what was going on in their heads. I mean, don't even get me started on the whole berserker rage thing because that itself is very intense. But basically, when the Horde would return home, they seemed to have caused a lot of problems because many of them couldn't turn off their rage and would just wreak havoc on the town. To deal with this, it is said that a series of Icelandic sagas were written as a sort of profile to warn the homegrown Vikings of what to look out for when the others would return. 
they had to kind of alter their stories a little bit because if they were too specific, then it would have caused people to learn to be afraid of basically any Viking man. So they had to keep things a little generic, but for the most part, people learned to stay away from those who couldn't turn off the berserker rage at home in order to keep themselves and the rest of their community safe. Kicking off the list at number 10. Wiper, no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go, where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Because you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, hm, hm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brick-lined pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy at a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We've talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers were responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three-in-one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, Dormad toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered and they're destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven, shards and shards. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. I think again. This is a part four, and honestly, I can do four more parts on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my God. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all, not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. It's not, they're gonna, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? 
Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, mm, there you go. Number five. Shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake-up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four-in-one shampoos. That wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It's just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, aqua tofana. Not to be confused with Aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tefania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tefana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig? Then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a shit on a boat? Whale watching fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day, before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, I think. I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Ray's is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Ray's is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. Mm. 
So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesbro Pons bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box. A warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. Guys, that was a part four. Those are some crazy hygiene products used in history. I think a part five is doable. Comment down below if you want some more fun, gross facts, and I'll return probably with the same beanie and do the rest. You guys have been great. We'll see you next time on Bumblebee. I'm Taylor McWatters. Peace. When cheese, cheese bro, oh, chess bro. Cheese bro, they're like, hey, what's up? So what's this rumor that they're not, oh, sorry, I'm refloing. Refloing, uh, back up, I, I was too slow. It's like face wash, body wash, foot wash, mouth wash, hair. I'm like, what? This, no way. No, stop it, Axe. Stop. Number seven, shards and sharts. At number 10, inventions. Leonardo da Vinci was quite the smarty pants. We all know him mostly for his paintings. However, he was so much more than just a mere artiste. Da Vinci was famous for his designs and art, as well as cartography, geology, and other studies. What's most impressive about Da Vinci are his inventions because he drew or described a number of devices that wouldn't be fully realized until centuries later. Some of his inventions include an underwater diving suit, like a scuba suit, an armored tank, a calculator, the machine gun, a keyboard, construction crane, a robot, and a flying machine. We have all of these things today, but back in Da Vinci's time, these inventions were quite bold. Leonardo conceptualized the armored tank 400 years before this invention was actually realized and used in World War I. Many of da Vinci's inventions went unpublished during his life and his notes and inventions were just passed on and created without giving da Vinci credit, but as we find more and more of da Vinci's lost notes, we are seeing just how many things he was inventing and how he's shaped our world so significantly. I wonder what other things Leo invented that we don't know about. At number 9, his lovers. Not much is known about Leonardo da Vinci's personal life. We know that he was never married, but that doesn't mean that the artist didn't have a love life. It is believed that da Vinci had a couple of lovers throughout his life, but there's no solid proof, only speculation and theories. Though we may never know for certain what his sexuality was, there are theories that suggest that da Vinci was into men. Many people believe that at one point da Vinci had some kind of relationship with his mentor, Andrea del Verrocchio, outside of their mentor-mentee partnership. There is also speculation that two of da Vinci's students were also his lovers, Gian Giacomo Caprotti and Francesco Melzi. Both joined da Vinci's atelier when they were 10 and 15 respectively, but it is believed that there were romantic ties between them. Caprotti is thought to have been da Vinci's favorite, and he even left Caprotti a mysterious inheritance in his will when he died. Back in Renaissance Italy, homosexuality was illegal, so if they were really Leonardo's lovers, they would have needed to keep things very secret. There was a report filed against da Vinci alluding to his sexuality, but because they were anonymous, the charges against the artist were dropped. Before we carry on talking about the mysterious life of Leonardo da Vinci, let me first take a moment to ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mona Lisa Smirk. For some reason, people for years have been so obsessed with the Mona Lisa and her mysterious smirk. I mean, I don't really get what's so mysterious about it, but apparently it has been a hot topic in the art world. For years, people have been trying to piece together who Mona Lisa was and why she was smiling like that. Scans of the famous paintings have revealed many secrets, and countless scientists took a stab at trying to crack the case on this whole Mona Lisa mystery, but it seems like one person is thought to have figured out why Mona Lisa looked the way she does. Dr. Mandeep R. Mera, a physician from Boston, was standing in line to view the painting when he noticed her quote, sallow complexion, thinning hair, and misaligned smile, end quote. It was then that he diagnosed the woman in the painting with hypothyroidism. He suggested that her odd smile could have been connected to muscle weakness caused by her potential hypothyroidism. This combined with her thin and receding hairline, a bump next to her left eye, lack of eyebrow hair, yellow skin, and bump on her neck suggested that she was suffering from this glandular condition. To back up this theory, research was done on food that women would have eaten at the time that this painting was done, and because they ate a relatively iodine deficient diet, this could have caused the development of hypothyroidism since iodine is essential in maintaining thyroid health. 
At number seven, his mother. As I mentioned earlier, Da Vinci's personal life had its own mysteries. One of the greater mysteries from Leonardo da Vinci's life is his mother. No one really knows who she was or where she came from, but there are a handful of theories. What we do know of his early life is that Leonardo was born on April 15th, 1452. His father was Piero, a Florentine notary who was a famous womanizer, and his mother was Caterina. But other than her name, not much else is known about Caterina. The reason we don't know much about her is because she really wasn't in Leonardo's life. She spent little time with him and she sent him to live with his father. Historians have been able to narrow down a couple of people who could have been Leonardo's mother. She could have been Caterina de Mio de Lippo, who was a pauper from a neglected farm, or she could have been Caterina de Antonio de Cambio, who was the daughter of small landowners. It is also theorized that Caterina could have been a former slave from the Middle East because the name Caterina was a common name among women who converted to Catholicism. And since analysis of Leonardo's fingerprint indicated traits commonly found in people of Arabic descent, this could actually back up that theory. At number six, The Last Supper. Many of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings are shrouded in mystery. There are many mysteries surrounding the Mona Lisa, other than the one I previously mentioned, and there are a couple of other pieces with a lot of unanswered questions, but let me tell you about one of the mysteries surrounding da Vinci's The Last Supper. The Last Supper is a depiction of Jesus and his disciples at the last Passover meal before Jesus' crucifixion. Though it looks like a normal painting, there are hidden Easter eggs that raise some questions. Dan Brown, the author of The Da Vinci Code, came up with a theory that Mary Magdalene is depicted in the painting. Mary Magdalene is thought to have potentially been Jesus' wife, and according to Dan Brown, the disciple in the painting that was previously identified as John was actually Mary Magdalene because this person had softer features that could be perceived as feminine. There is a counter argument to this theory, saying that the softer features in the painting were more so to depict the youth of the disciple John because he was the youngest of Jesus' disciples. But what do you guys think? Is there actually merit to this theory? At number five, unfinished. From what we've learned about Leonardo da Vinci, he seemed like the type of person who marched to the beat of his own drum. He did whatever he wanted, when he wanted, and no one could tell him otherwise. Or at least that's how I perceive him anyway. But I think that this perception of him could also be backed up by the fact that he apparently rarely ever finished his work. Apparently, da Vinci was known to leave commissions and his own personal works unfinished. He was a meh, not really feeling this one right now kind of guy. Turns out the Mona Lisa was actually a commission project from a wealthy silk merchant to the Medici, and he never received the painting. Some of da Vinci's other works, like the Sforza Horse Monument and the Battle of Anghiari Mural, were also abandoned and never completed by the artist. As you can imagine, his clients would often hound and harass Leonardo for the completed pieces that he often never even started. He got so tired of painting later in life that he said that he could not even bear the sight of a paintbrush. I have to say, I kind of feel bad for the people who never got their commission pieces because I'm sure they would have been quite incredible. At number four, Salvatore Mundi. Here's another one of Leonardo da Vinci's pieces that is shrouded in mystery. Salvatore Mundi is one of da Vinci's paintings that has a lot of unanswered questions. People have wondered about the orb in the painting that's held by Jesus. People who know da Vinci's work notice that there is no refraction in the orb, which is uncharacteristic of da Vinci because he knew all about the physics there. But this mystery opened up a whole new jar of worms and a new question that is, did Leonardo da Vinci even paint Salvatore Mundi? And the answer is actually no. I know, crazy, right? For all these years, we thought that this was a da Vinci original, but it turns out that only about 20% of the painting was actually done by da Vinci himself. After analyzing the painting's artistic details and painting techniques, it is believed that Leonardo's assistant, Bernardino Luini, was the one to paint the majority of this piece. Luini was a painter in his own right, but his pieces never really fetched as much money as da Vinci's. Adding to all of this painting drama though, it is believed that Leonardo only completed about 15 paintings in his entire lifetime, so there's something to think about. At number three, dissection. Much like a lot of thinkers from back in the day, Leonardo da Vinci was curious about anatomy. His studies of anatomy first began as research for his paintings. He wanted to be as accurate to the human form as possible, and apparently he was quite a stickler about that. But later on, that research turned into a full-blown fascination for da Vinci. He went from merely researching anatomy to seeking a deeper understanding of the physiology of living things. As part of his research, Leonardo da Vinci was known to dissect human and animal bodies. 
bodies. He was fascinated by physiology and there was no limits to how far he would go out of curiosity. He was known to have removed a human eyeball and sliced it open to better understand its function and how it worked. Quite strange, but clearly it helped him out in his art, so as long as the people he was dissecting had already kicked the bucket, then all power to you, Leo. At number two, where is Leonardo? One of the biggest mysteries about the end of Leonardo da Vinci's life is where the heck is he? No one really knows what happened to the famed painter's remains. His tomb no longer exists and his bones are nowhere to be found. When he died, he was buried at the Church of Saint Florentine in Amboise, France, but in the early 1800s, after years of erosion and revolutionary vandalism, the chapel needed to be repaired and they used gravestones and tombstones to repair the building. Children were known to play with the abandoned bones from the graveyard and so a gardener gathered the bones and buried them. None of the remains have really ever been pieced together, so they remain lost. It is believed that Leonardo's remains could have ended up in the castle of Amboise, but we don't really know if they're actually his remains or not. And finally, at number one, ciphers and encryptions. Leonardo da Vinci created a lot of mysteries for us to solve in modern day, but he was quite the mysterious man himself because he was known to use codes and encryptions. All of his notes were written backwards with a mirror, and though it isn't known for certain why he did this, many believe that it was to protect his inventions and other notes from falling into the wrong hands. Though it's a pretty easy encryption to figure out, to the average wandering person, the notes would have just looked like gibberish. Other people believe that he wrote everything backwards because he was left handed and it was just easier for him to write backwards. Number 10, the cutting edge. So I feel like I have to start here because this really was the prima donna of the revolution. One of the reasons the French Revolution became such a bloody event was due to the guillotine. It became the primary symbol of the French Revolution as the peasants exacted revenge on the aristocracy. It became known as the National Razor and Madame la Guillotine. Prior to the events of the revolution, Executions were much more violent and cruel, if you can believe that. One involved quartering, which uh, we won't get into, but you can imagine how bad that is if you take that literally. But Dr. Joseph Guillotine, a member of the French National Assembly, argued that there should be a painless and private capital punishment, and even argued against capital punishment in general. He didn't want it to happen. So Dr. Guillotine, along with a German and a harpsichord maker, Tobias Schmidt, invented the first prototype for the death machine. From there, the rest was history. It is estimated over 40,000 people were executed à la raison during the reign of terror. Pretty bad for a guy who really didn't want it to happen, but hey, at least it was painless. If the blade was sharp. If it wasn't, ugh. Number nine, the national anthem. Uh, you know what's funny about going to theater school is that the more you learn, the more your teachers are like, hey, if something bad happens to you, you can use it. It's fuel for your art. Which is what immediately what I thought of when I heard this story. Which is why, to me, it kind of makes sense that the origins of the French national anthem happened during the French Revolution. They used their pain to make something good. Going through something dramatic? Sing about it. The monarchies of Europe were pretty pissed about the fact that they were killing a bunch of their friends and loved ones, so they formed a coalition to defeat the resistance and restore the monarchy. The French Baron Philippe Friedrich Dietrich requested that Rouget de Lis, another French officer, Compose a song that would rally the troops. So he wrote the first anthem called Chant de Guerre pour l'Arme de Rhin, which translates to War for the Army of Rhin. Volunteers carried the anthem all throughout the streets of Paris as they marched on the capital. The song title got subbed out for the simpler one called the Marseillaise, which became the Republic's anthem in 1795. And now, even today, it is the national anthem of France. Number eight, the tennis court oath. You'd think it would be like at a pub or on the street. Why I think that, I don't. I don't know, but it wasn't. One of the earliest acts of defiance in the French Revolution took place on a tennis court of all places. To say that Louis XVI was ill-equipped to handle the financial debt that his father and his grandfather built prior to his reign is kind of, well, it's an understatement. He had no clue. He made a desperate attempt in 1789 to address the economic issues by assembling the Estates Générale. It was a national assembly with three factions, each one representing either the nobles, the clergy, and the commoners. The third estates, which is the commoners, had the most members and declared themselves the National Assembly. There was a long list, a long list of overdue grievances, and they declared that they would force a new constitution on the king. Initially things were looking up as Louis legalized the assembly, but he locked them out of the damn meeting, 
So they moved to an indoor tennis court and took an oath to never disband until a new written constitution was formed for France. But very soon after that, they stormed the Bastille. But we'll get to the Bastille later. Number seven, give us bread. The French Revolution very much erupted due to the financial distress of the people. But the tipping point was the moment bread became unattainable to the common Parisian. Bread is a huge thing in France, and it was a huge kind of staple meal for every Parisian. Marie Antoinette's famous misquoted response to the people asking for bread was, let them eat cake. Though it's debated whether she actually said that, it does summarize this yeasty flashpoint in history. They should have known better. In 1529, riots over grain in the Great Rebellion led to thousands of peasants destroying houses of the rich all in the name of grain. But they didn't listen to their history, they made it worse. The king was counseled by the physiocrats since the 1760s who firmly believed that the wealth of the nation was derived solely from the value of the land. Therefore, agricultural products should be highly priced. Uh. So they tried to intermittently deregulate the domestic trade to introduce free trade, but needless to say, they failed so hard. They caused food shortages and skyrocketed prices, which erupted in the flour war over 300 riots to pillage grain in 1775. Layers and layers of tensions were added, along with other economic distress and all this stuff, added to the fuel of the blaze that would be later the French Revolution. Number six, flip a coin. Now, the royal family obviously didn't go willingly to their deaths. They at first tried to escape. As I previously mentioned, bread was a big deal, and on October 5th, 1789, a large crowd of mostly women began to assemble at the markets. Why were they there? To discuss the steep price of bread. But they were dismissed, so they marched from Paris to the Palace of Versailles and stormed the place. They took out several guards and chanted over and over to the king, live among the people. Louis conceded, he said, yeah, okay, and agreed to go with them to Paris, agreed, kind of. But but meanwhile, the royal family was placed under protection, and on the night of June 1971, the nobles dressed as their servants, and their servants dressed as them, and the nobles made an attempt to escape to Austria. Now, if it were 2021, the king would probably have some arrogant social media so everyone would know what he looked like, but the commoners outside didn't. They had no pictures of him, so it was the perfect disguise. But his face was on every coin in France, and it was because of this he was recognized at the border and sent back. Now we know what happened next. Number five, last words. While she was alive, Marie Antoinette was abhorred, absolutely detested, they hated her. But funny enough, today she's incredibly well loved. Historians believe that due to rumors and hatred of the time, her character was misinterpreted. What do I think? Well, she was the product of the aristocracy that pretty much poisoned their own well. She was a bystander. But one of the moments that leads people to believe in her kinder nature was her last words. As Marie Antoinette walked up to the guillotine on October 16th, 1793, she stepped on the foot of her executioner by accident. Some say it was something else, but either way, her last words were reported as, I'm sorry. Number four, the Bastille. Bastille, Bastille, Bastille. What am I talking about? It seems wrong not to mention one of the most pivotal moments in the French Revolution, the storming of the Bastille. Peasants rose up and literally stormed the most famous prison in France. But what you may not know is that they destroyed that building with their own bare hands. They tore it brick from brick because they didn't have any explosives. The Bastille was a fearsome 100 feet high, eight towered prison that became a symbol for the tyranny of the aristocrats. So it was only natural that they would take out their anger on this place. At dawn on July 14th, a crowd armed with only muskets, swords, makeshift weapons gathered around the Bastille. Their intent was to demand the ammunition stored there from the governor of the prison, the Marquis de Lanay. He and his men were eventually overwhelmed and the people stormed it. Lanay raised a white flag and surrendered. He and his men were taken into custody, gunpowder and cannons were seized, and seven prisoners were freed. Lanay was destroyed by the mob before he even met trial. This pivotal moment in history is celebrated as the French national holiday, even today. Number three, Charlotte Corday, assassin of Marat. So we have established a couple things. One is that the French Revolution was bloody, relentless, and pretty terrifying. As much as it proved the statement that people shouldn't be afraid of their governments, but the other way around, Alan Moore, V for Vendetta, it wasn't a great place to be. Enter Charlotte Corday. Charlotte was a passionate supporter of the revolution, 
even though its main conspirators were set on killing the likes of her. Charlotte was, after all, a noblewoman, though she opposed the reign of terror. There were two sides to the fray, the Girondists and the Jacobins, and Charlotte fought alongside the first, the Girondists. But the Jacobins were radical and tried to kill any and all oppositionists, the Girondists included. Which is why Charlotte decided that Jean Paul Marat, leader of the Jacobins, had to be taken out. She became an assassin. While Marat was taking a bath, Charlotte stormed in. She bought a knife and disguised as an informant went in to speak with him. She said she had news. At first, she delivered on her offer and told him of the escaped Girondists. At, he at once said that they would be guillotined and so she whipped out her knife and popped his bath bubbles for good. Corday knew she was going to be caught however and had told no one, not even her family, her plans so they wouldn't stop her. Charlotte was guillotined July 17th, 1793 with her name attached to her dress so she would be recognized. She wrote in a letter explaining her actions, I desire only that my head, carried through Paris, may be a rallying standard for all the friends of the law. Number 2. Public Zoo Did you know that in the middle of all that crazy turmoil and public executions, they managed to find time to open a public zoo? In 1793, the National Assembly declared that all privately owned exotic animals will be transferred to the menagerie at the Palace of Versailles, or killed, stuffed, and donated to scientists. Gladly though, the animals lives were spared and the menagerie was reopened as a zoo. It was free to the public and peasants got to go see exotic animals for the first time. Jacques-Henri Bernardin de Saint Pierre the founder passionately believed that the public should be educated about exotic animals. Now I can't be sure how well the animals were treated, I assume it wasn't very great, but this was technically the first zoo. Number 1 Maximilien Robespierre Now it only seems fitting that we end this list at the end. Maximilien Robespierre started out with good intentions, but even though the revolution was about the dismantling of power, Maximilien became corrupted by it. Yes, he did topple the monarchy and put the power back to the people, but then he took it back for himself and got a little crazy, you know the whole thing. Robespierre worked as a lawyer in France and focused a lot of his cases towards the underprivileged classes. This got him a lot of popularity and he eventually rose to be the poster child of the revolution, the leader of the revolution. He became the head of public safety after Louis and Marie lost their heads and continued to accuse many members of the national convention of treasonous and unrevolutionary activities all over the place. Remember the whole thing between the Girondists and the Jacobins? This was that. In less than a year, 300,000 people were arrested, 10,000 died in prison and 17,000 were guillotined. I think those numbers might be slightly off but that's kind of what the research said. One by one he sent them all to the guillotine until he eventually was elected the president of the national convention. Within 6 days he passed a law that suspended the right to a public trial and to legal assistance and by the end of that month and by the end of that month 1400 were guillotined. Talk about trigger happy. Finally the right and the left had to reunite in order to overthrow him. <laughs> And he was eventually met the blade himself. Kind of crazy how full circle that is. And that was our juicy history list for today. If you want more like this, let me know in the comments. You know I love this stuff. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Murdochs. With the high profile of this ongoing case, coupled with the fact that Netflix just released a chilling documentary about the story of this family, it is likely that you may already have quite the idea of who the Murdoch family is. Taylor and I have been watching the documentary series. We're past the first few episodes and man is this story wild. A few years ago, if someone asked you who the Murdoch family was, you would have likely described them as one of the most powerful families in South Carolina with a legal dynasty that has spanned for a century. Now, if I asked you that same question, the answer would be a family who had it all. Money, power, status. But some of the members flew a little too close to the sun, tragedy ensued, and now people have lost their lives and the family has been destroyed. It started back in 2015 with the death of Stephen Smith. It carries on to 2018 when Gloria Satterfield, a long serving employee for the family, was found passed away after a quote trip and fall accident. These events are both horrible and completely atrocious, but despite the rumors, mysteries, and alleged conspirators of these deaths, things really started to unravel for the family in February of 2019 with the death of Mallory Beach. The young woman met her untimely fate after a boating accident where, allegedly, 19 year old Paul Murdoch was at the wheel, intoxicated. We could spend hours and hours talking about this family and all of these cases and the conspiracies, but we are short for time, which brings me right to the most recent tragedy. The 2021 killings of that same Murdoch who was driving the boat, as well as the killing of his mother, Margaret. Now I do 
believe that people are innocent until proven guilty, but it is important to note that the one on trial for these killings right now is the father and husband to the deceased, Alex Murdoch, the patriarch of the family who is supposed to be carrying on that Murdoch legacy. The stories surrounding this family are horrific, tragic, and a reminder of the dangers that money and power can bring. In our number 9 spot today we have the Sacklers. This family is the one behind the dynasty of Purdue Pharma who is best known for producing an exceptionally strong prescription painkiller. Of course, we all know just how big and rich a pharmaceutical company could get, especially one that has been around for quite some time. The company was first created in 1952 by three Brooklyn born brothers and in the beginning, the company mostly dealt in things like laxatives and earwax removal methods. Soon, things for the company took quite an upwards turn and before anyone knew it, the family was regarded as one of the most esteemed New York families, but they were also known for their philanthropic tendencies with their names on museums and hospitals, some of the most famous in the world. You see, the thing is, when they released this painkiller in 1995, it led to them amassing an insane $13 billion fortune. That is obviously incredible, but the trouble came when it was realized that this painkiller wasn't nearly as potent as it was marketed to be, and frequent users would be building up a tolerance to it, meaning they needed to use higher and higher dosages. Viewer, welcome to the opioid crisis. Basically, this all spiraled out of control and led to many, many lawsuits coming against Purdue Pharma. Not only by individuals, but by January 2019, 36 states were suing the company for what the painkiller had done to their citizens. After two years of deliberations, the Sacklers finally reached a deal with plaintiffs in bankruptcy court in September of 2021. As part of their Chapter 11 proposal, they agreed to pay $4.5 billion and give up all ownership of the company in exchange for complete immunity and all future opioid liability. Despite this fall from grace, the Sacklers were able to move an alleged $1.36 billion into offshore accounts, so despite their bankruptcy filing and the large sum of money handed over, they will continue to retain quite a large amount of their personal wealth. In our number 8 spot today we have the Bakers. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were once the most famous televangelists in America, and they certainly were living in quite a lap of luxury. They had beautiful homes, expensive cars, and a ton of money, but that quickly came crashing down amid horrendous scandal. In the late 1980s, after much success, Jim Baker resigned from the PTL ministry after there was a cover-up to hide some hush money that had been given to church secretary Jessica Hahn over an alleged essay situation. Of course, not necessarily a surprise, but definitely not a good look for a televangelist. This led to more interest in people looking into the family more, and soon it was uncovered that there was some sort of accounting fraud going on as well. The consequences for this came by way of felony charges, conviction, imprisonment and divorce. That was the end of that legacy, but since serving his time, Jim Baker hasn't exactly slowed down. He not only remarried and returned to televangelism, but he also currently hosts The Jim Baker Show, which focuses on the end times and the second coming of Christ while promoting emergency survival products. So. That's interesting. In our number 7 spot today we have Prince Sado. Born in 1735, Prince Sado was the heir to the Korean throne, but unfortunately, he would go on to suffer from extreme mental illness and delusions. Thankfully for historians and those of us interested in history, the wife of the prince created memoirs and in them she detailed the horrifying things that happened next. The prince began to kill. He began to hurt and torment people. He basically turned their home into a house of horrors. The prince also endured some pretty horrific treatment from his own father, which of course is not an excuse for the things he did, but it definitely did not help the scenario. Eventually, the family had enough and realized that his behavior would go on to ruin the name of their family forever, so something needed to be done. At the time, tradition stated that if the prince were to be executed, his wife and child would also need to be, but everyone thought that maybe that was a bit too far. Why should they have to pay for his crimes? This led to the king coming up with quite the bizarre workaround for this. On a hot day in July, the king forced the prince to step into a rice chest, which was then locked behind him. This acted as a way to make it seem like he had caused his own death, which is said to have occurred just a few days later. In our number 6 spot today we have Don Carlos. This little troublemaker never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kinds of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias 
Louis in the mid 1500s as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth, which many believe could be due to inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviors though are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things like hurting or taking the lives of animals for fun. Nowadays we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then it was like, I don't know. Was anybody even watching you, really? It is even said that at one point he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Soon, of course, his cruelties would extend to humans, with people claiming that one time he chose to harm a servant girl for no reason other than because he could. Major King Joffrey vibes in that one. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made that the prince didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided that there was absolutely no way in hell. Like, he was so bad that she would rather marry his dad. Which she did in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement where he passed away six months later. In our number five spot today, we have Prince John. It is said that this may be one of the darkest secrets of the British royal family. Prince John would have been the uncle of Queen Elizabeth II, but he passed before she was born. Prince John was the sixth child of King George V and Queen Mary, and it is said that he suffered from seizures, likely as a result of epilepsy, although though it's hard to diagnose for certain because of all of the secrecies surrounding him and his illness. From the age of four, when he had his first seizure until his untimely and very early death, Prince John lived in a separate estate where he was cared for by a governess. Many people have since criticized the royal family, calling their treatment of Prince John as callous or inhumane, like they were hiding him away for being ill. Of course, the palace was concerned with the monarchy's public image, and there was a belief at the time that royals shouldn't have any physical or mental ailments, although that is of course impossible. They also didn't include him in public events, which could have been another image thing, and also perhaps because of a worry that he might have a seizure at one of these events. At the end of the day, it was definitely a different time, but the idea of excluding him because he was ill truly is a really sad thought. In our number four spot today, we have Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy. This is a royal scandal that took place all the way back in 1314, and it starts off with the daughters-in-law of King Philip IV of France. I think that's the fourth. Here's hoping. These young women, Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy, were accused of having quite a scandalous affair with two brothers, Philippe and Gautier. So this already is some hot tea, but apparently when Queen Isabella of England, who is the daughter of King Philip of France, so I guess like sister in law with these ladies, when she heard these stories, apparently she's the one who totally outed their affairs. It was obviously a huge deal, and both of the women admitted to their adultery. This led to them being pretty much erased from public knowledge. They had their hair cut short, and they were thrown in a dungeon. And even though Marguerite was meant to be the queen of France through her marriage, when her husband ascended the throne, she stayed locked in the dungeon until the marriage could be annulled. Little is known about what happened to either of them after this point. However, it is believed that Marguerite passed away in 1315 and Blanche 1326. As for the men in this affair, well, they met quite a gruesome fate that involved the removal of their bits and pieces before their swift execution. In our number three spot today, we have the Duggars. All right, one of the most famous reality TV families. And even before the horrors of this family came to light, they were already a family that had fame due to quite a strange reason. If you're unfamiliar with who the Duggars are, you might be more familiar with the show that they used to have on TLC titled 19 Kids and Counting. Yeah, the show ran on TLC for seven years until it was canceled in 2015, and the show featured, well, the Duggar family. The family consisted of parents Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar and their 19 children, nine daughters and 10 sons, all of whose names begin with the letter J. It was an interesting time, and they seemed like this huge, happy, religious family. But in the years since the cancellation of the show, some horrifying things came to light. Initially, the reason that TLC suspended and then subsequently canceled the show is because it came to light that the eldest son in the family, Josh, had done some horrible things and acted violently, horrendously, and inexcusably against a number of girls, even some in his own family. Due to the popularity of the show before these serious stories came to light, there was a spin-off show that was created titled Counting On. This show first aired in December 2015 and stayed on the air for a surprising number of years before it was pulled, and the family yet again found themselves in the center of a scandal that had to do with Josh. This time he was caught in possession of a certain kind of tape that no one should have, and that should not even exist at all. I can't say which kind of tape, but just know it's the worst of the worst. 
worst. These are, of course, some of the worst scandals that have surrounded the family, but truly, it's only a drop in the bucket of the many stories surrounding them. In our number two spot today, we have King Juan Carlos. The former King Juan Carlos of Spain, when he first ascended the throne in 1975, was highly looked upon. He was said to be bringing a new age for the country, an age of democracy. His reign lasted for quite a while, but by the time 2014 rolled around, he was forced to abdicate the throne. This was due to a few reasons. Firstly, his public ratings started to plummet after word spread of him being a bit of a womanizer and after an explosive affair, but also because of a lavish elephant hunting trip he took in the middle of an economic collapse. Okay. Fair enough, I can see why people were getting their guard up a bit. So the king abdicated the throne in favor of his son Philippe, who sits on it to this day. During this time, however, the scandals in the family weren't only to do with Juan Carlos. In January of 2014, another of his children, his daughter Infanta Cristina, was charged with tax fraud. She has since been acquitted, that happened in 2017, but she was stripped of her title as the Duchess of Palma de Mallorca, and this whole deal had her leaving Spain and moving to Switzerland. The drama doesn't end here, however, because her husband husband actually was convicted in the case with charges that included embezzlement, fraud, and tax evasion, and he received prison time in 2018. In the end, none of the fraud charges have ever been linked back to the former king, but this entire debacle did cause the former ruler to move out of Spain. With his move came a letter, part of which read, quote, guided by the conviction to perform the best service to the Spanish people, their institutions, and you as king, I am communicating my thoughtful decision to move at this time outside of Spain. A decision I make with sadness, but with great serenity. I have been king of Spain for almost 40 years, and during all of them, I have always wanted the best for Spain and for the crown. In our number one spot today, we have the Rothschilds. This family is easily one of the most, if not the most, powerful family in the modern era. In fact, it is said that most of us in the Western world don't even realize the impact this family has had on our lives, as our consumer-driven lifestyle is definitely directly related to the monetary systems this family put in place. This would include the United States Federal Reserve. Because of this insane amount of money and power that this family has held for over a century, there are plenty of conspiracy theories going on surrounding them. The conspiracies run deep, and they they go quite dark. They touch on everything from assassination attempts, some successfully completed on sitting presidents, to heinous World War II agendas that would have benefited the family. Of course, they are conspiracies, so no one is quite sure which of these secrets, if any, are true. Even still, the stories and speculation swirl today, waiting for some piece of evidence to maybe bring them to light. Number 10. Not so friendly fire. What happens when you mix an Ottoman invasion, alcohol, and gunpowder? I'm not sure, but I imagine it's pretty bad. Just like the Battle of Karensbys, where embarrassingly enough, the Austrian army fired upon itself. Now, looking up military history will tell you that friendly fire incidents are more common than you might think. I'm looking at you, Vietnam War, but this incident is a little more unique, as it may have started over a bottle of booze. A group of soldiers procured some alcohol and was enjoying the joys of liquid courage. After getting too boisterous, more Austrians wanted to join in. Not wanting to share their boozy finds and feelings, a fight broke out. The Austrian army was composed of multiple nations, so there were a few different languages being spoken. And by that, I mean a very confusing fight broke out. Eventually, someone fired a shot, someone shouted Turks, and a very embarrassing battle ensued. By the end, it's speculated that 10,000 Austrians were unalived during this boozy mistake. That's, hey. Hey, happens. Mistakes are made, happens. Number 9. History's Second Favorite Mustache When we talk about history, it's really hard not to talk about Germany and a little man with a weird mustache. World War II is the cause and effect for a lot of reasons and things today. That too could honestly be its own video, but what's rather uncommon to talk about in history's classrooms is history's second favorite mustache man rhymes with Sosef Jalin. The battles between Germany and the Soviet Union during World War II were some of the worst, Stalingrad having the most casualties than any other battle during the war. The Soviet Union would fight back its invaders, but when they were pushing into the heart of Germany, it wasn't so much as liberating as oppressing. oppressing. The comrade in chief is known for targeting ethnic groups with starvation and having a tight grip on the Soviet people by threatening them with gulags. Harsh and brutal labor camps where anyone who opposed his regime would be worked to death in conditions that harsh and brutal simply don't cover. Historians believe his regime was responsible for the deaths of 20 million people, which is almost double the amount of his German doppelganger. 
Not cool. Number eight, abandoned by the world. 1930s Germany wasn't a great place to be if you were Jewish. Matter of fact, anywhere near Germany was a bad time for Jewish people. Some people saw the writing on the wall and it was clear. Anyone lighting a menorah during the holiday season needed to leave Europe and set sail for more liberal waters. In 1939, a vessel called the St. Louis arrived in North American waters, searching for freedom and to escape persecution. Persecution that would likely lead to their deaths. This is an unfortunate black spot in Western democracies. As for the weary travelers, finding someone who would take them in was proving difficult. They tried Cuba, but were refused all but a handful. Then the US, same thing happened. They even tried glorious Canada, where they too refused them. Canada, a country of freedom and acceptance for all, turned down people in their darkest hour. Sadly, the boat returned to Europe where they met the same fate as other Jews who were oppressed by the regime. Number 7. Civil Rights I know a lot of these are World War II related, but, but bear with me guys. It had a lot of uncomfortable moments. Some that should be talked about. Acknowledging and apologizing for mistakes of the past is a sure way to have a brighter future. During World War II, there was something called the Germany First policy, meaning a lot of effort was made to defeat Germany first, but Imperial Japan was just as much as a threat. Apparently so much so that President Roosevelt wanted to put Japanese Americans in something called relocation camps. Thousands of Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians, cause oh yeah, we did it too, were taken from their homes and relocated to camps in order to prevent a second Pearl Harbor. You don't need an HR manager to tell you what an egregious act this is against civil rights. While they were not like the camps found in Europe, it's yet another dark splotch on two countries who boast about their freedoms and democracy. The camps were closed shortly after the war had ended. Number 6. Moving Forward Together European settlers were not very nice to Indian tribes. That's probably no surprise to anyone, but what might be unknown to some is Canada's treatment of First Nations peoples. More specifically, residential schools, a system supported by the church and Canadian government to indoctrinate and assimilate First Nations children into European North American culture. Children were forcibly taken from their homes and were forced to learn against their own beliefs, language, and were victims of crimes and physical harm. Sadly for First Nations, this was somewhat effective and did a good job displacing families. The last residential school closed in 1997, which for many is still too recent and a painful reminder of Canada's past. Furthering the horrors of the residential schools was the discovery of unmarked graves in 2021, where hundreds of indigenous children's remains were found, showing that Canada has a long way to go. We can and will do better. Number 5. Sticky Situation The molasses flood of 1919 sounds like a lot of sweet fun, but it was actually a horrific event, and not just for diabetics. It was uncomfortable for two reasons. Reason number one being that 21 people lost their lives at what must have been the most confusing thing ever to see. A rush of sticky molasses flooded the streets of Boston and caused a crazy amount of damage. Reason number two being, well, how this occurred in the first place. I'll give the folks at home a second to take a guess at how they think it happened. Ready? If you said workplace neglect, congratulations, you went bragging rights. Basically, it was foobar from the start. The large tank that held the sweet stuff wasn't built properly, wasn't properly inspected by professionals. No one really understood, I guess, that fermentation produces gas, which made an already unsafe tank more unsafe. And well, there you go, boom, an unholy sticky flood. Probably one of the biggest lessons in work safety history. And let's be honest, who wants to swim in molasses? You never get out of it. Number 4. Broken Arrow The Cold War wasn't exactly cold, as nuclear weapons had the potential to make it hot. Too hot. So here's something to make everyone lose a little more sleep at night, because I know everyone at home is stress free right now and gets a full 8 hours of sleep. Today when you lay your wee head to rest on count sheep, I want you to think about Broken Arrow. No, not actually a broken arrow, but the broken arrow incident or incidents, which if you didn't know is the code phrase for a nuclear device gun MIA. For example, on July 28th, a US aircraft from Dover Air Force Base, Delaware was carrying three nuclear bombs over the Atlantic Ocean. The plane experienced a loss of power and the crew jettisoned two nuclear bombs into the ocean and they have never been recovered. Wow, that's great. There were at least another dozen broken arrow incidents from the 1950s until the end of the Cold War. Now, as bad as that sounds, I mean, it's pretty bad. These are our nukes we're talking about. At least America's lost bombs were recorded. Nobody really knows how many bombs the Soviet Union lost during the Cold War. Gee, now I feel real swell and safe. Number three, Ich bin ein Berliner. 
This may be old news to those of our older audience, but news to younger. And honestly, it's crazy that it even happened in the first place. So World War II ends, right? And the Allies are all super good friends, right? Wrong! Berlin basically gets split into two, Capitalist West and Communist East. So the Cold War kicks off, a very strong disagreement on what political and economical structure is better. As it turns out, life was just better on the West. People in the East just didn't have access to certain things the West did. So people started bailing shit. I don't blame them. So much so that a wall was built dividing the two. This may not sound like much, but it was huge. The Berlin Wall divided families, business, and put on the full display of failure that communism was. As JFK said, democracy is not perfect, but we've never had to put a wall up to keep our people in. And honestly, the guy's right. That's just kind of crazy. Number two, can't beat him, join him. Japan was the new cool kid in school, and by that, I mean they were the most powerful force in Asia in the late 1930s. Japan rapidly adopted westernized ideas, structures, and the old habit of invading foreign nations, and wrecking absolute havoc when there. Specifically, Nanking in 1937. Some historians consider this to be the beginning of World War II, but it's debatable. What's not debatable is the uncomfortable way Imperial Japanese forces treated Chinese civilians. Japan was expanding during the early 20th century, and China was next on the schedule. I'm going to recommend you Google this one at home, as there is so much naughty stuff about Nanking in 1937 that I'd get the censors a headache just thinking about it. There's a really infamous photograph that you probably haven't seen, and it's 100% not safe for work. The invasion of China and incidents like that of Nanking still have sour relations between the two nations today. Number one, the world is yours. Okay, so kind of a broad stroke here, but very fitting. I'm putting everything the British Empire did at the number one spot. I mean, come on, guys, it's the British Empire. Sure, it's no secret what they did, but there's so much to unpack here. It's a lot. Redcoats have been making things uncomfortable since the late 1600s. The American colonies and how they treated Indians, the occupation of actual India, and the opium wars in China, just to name a few. At its height, the British Empire had conquered. 25% of the Earth's land surface. And like I always say, when you get that big, you gotta break a few eggs along the way to make your omelet. That's gonna wrap it up for today, guys. Make sure to subscribe to Bumblebee. I've been your host, Big Ched. If you think I'm alright like my mom does. At number 10, Veil. Through this video, you will come to find out that a lot of the wedding traditions that we practice these days have some pretty messed up origins. We'll get through a lot of them throughout this list, but let's start off by talking about the bride's veil. These days, a lot of brides choose to wear a veil on their wedding day. With so many different styles to choose from, this accessory is known to add that extra little pizzazz, little spice to the look. But throughout history, veils were used for different things, some of them being a tad bit messed up. Just a smidge. The rather obvious reason for brides to wear a veil back in the day had to do with religion and staying modest. But this hasn't been the only reason for veils. In ancient Rome, brides wore veils because it was believed to be effective at warding off evil spirits. The most messed up reason for the veil though, at least in my opinion anyway, has to do with the wedding transaction, so to speak. Since back in the olden days, marrying your daughter off was seen as more of a transaction, brides would wear veils to cover their faces and they wouldn't be lifted until after they were proclaimed husband and wife so that the groom wouldn't be able to back out if he didn't like how his bride looked. Seems pretty messed up to me, but what are your thoughts on it? Tell us down in the comments. Number 9. When Doves Cry I've been to one wedding where they released doves, like actual real life doves, and I was like, do they actually do this? I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know it was a real thing. Why do we do this? Well, because doves mate for life, and they build a nest, and then they Netflix and chill until the end of their dove days. Sounds like perfect symbolism if I've ever heard it. Back in ancient Roman and Greek times, doves were often used as gifts from the bride to the groom. Pretty shitty gift if you ask me. Here's a bird that we now have to both take care of. The snow white ring neck dove is used by magicians. They can't fly too well. They don't have a homing instinct. Whereas rock doves, the ones commonly used in weddings that we see fly away over Nana's head, they have a homing instinct for hundreds of miles. So they're perfect for the gig. But they couldn't be released during foul weather and they needed two hours before the sun sets in order for them to fly home. The wedding band has less rules than the doves. That's amazing. Their rider is much smaller. If you were to catch one of these doves at a wedding, you were also allowed to keep it back in the day. Also, great hands. I don't know who's catching birds or why they want to keep it and put it in their pocket, but 
You do you. At number eight, best man. These days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, whether that's a brother or a best friend. But back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different and was all about protecting one's assets. Back then, bride napping was actually very common, so if there was someone else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to another person, they might try and steal her away for themselves. Yeah, why? I don't know. This is where the best man came in. The best man's job was to protect the bride and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure that she didn't try and make a run for it herself. They really said, try to derail this wedding and see what happens. Number seven, a June wedding. As we're counting down this list slowly but surely, you've probably begun fantasizing maybe about your own wedding one day. Maybe it's a beach wedding, maybe it's themed like a winter wonderland. Doesn't that sound cozy? It's your big day, get creative. They say the best month to get married is June, and from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree with that. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must, not just a thing you wanted to do. See, June was the month of the god Juno. They protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth, so if it's between that and like, I don't know, Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, better omens for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then, so when majority of the population did finally you know, wash up. At the end of May or beginning of June, that's often when it would happen. Everybody smelled nice, they felt good, and they wanted to celebrate. So it was perfect timing. Better get me while my pits smell good, you know? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can quickly hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Maternity leave who? Never heard of her. At number six, hashtag twinning. You know how at weddings the bridesmaids are usually wearing matching outfits? Well, this tradition dates back centuries, though it has changed slightly over the years. Remember how I mentioned that people would sometimes try to kidnap the bride on her wedding day? Well, other than the best man and the groomsmen trying to play their part in protecting the bride from being taken, the bridesmaids also played a part in that too. The bridesmaids used to dress identically to the bride so that it would make it harder to spot her and therefore prevent anyone from kidnapping her. This practice dates all the way back to ancient Rome and feudal China and didn't really start to fade out of tradition until around the 1880s. These days you get a couple of gifts from the bride for being in her posse but back then you didn't get any Thing, and you had to risk your safety for your girl Becky who doesn't even want to marry Jeff down the block. I don't know. Number five, a toast. My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches or the toasts. They're always way too long or too personal or you know what, just too depressing. Just way too sad, just tears. You're like, why, why are we talking about this? It's a nerve wracking part, even as a guest, just to get up randomly and be like, okay, look at me everyone, hi. No, I don't want to do that. Back in the 1800s though, only men were allowed to give these toasts. The oldest friend, the groom, the best man, and then the father of the bride. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes. Guys suck at speeches. They're just like, uh, uh, a lot of ums, that's all I'm saying. Wedding toasts go back as far as the sixth century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine just to make sure it wasn't poisoned or anything. Romans would also drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter, hence the term toast. Yeah, now we get it. Yeah, wine was so bad back then, they had to use burnt toast crystal light just to get through the day. Yuck. At number four, transaction. I find it to be just a little bit messed up how before now, marriage was mostly about money or status and not about love. For a long time, people didn't get to choose who they got to marry and there was almost always some kind of monetary transaction involved in the wedding. This whole idea here is a reason for the traditional act of the bride's father walking her down the aisle and giving her away, so to speak. In the past, fathers of the bride and groom would come together to establish an agreement, like X amount of money for someone's daughter or whatever. Once that was set up, the wedding became a big deal to see if the transaction would actually go through and many precautions were put in place to make sure that no one backed out. One of those precautions was the act of the father walking his daughter down the aisle. This was done so that they stayed close to one another in the off chance that the groom or his family decided to back out. That really took the romance and sparkle out of weddings now. Number three, wedding cake. 
As the youngest of three, I can confirm that we get away with the most. The youngest often do. The middle child is just plain ignored. Then the oldest, well, they usually have the most responsibility in the family. Usually when a bride and groom cut the cake on their big day, it's for them. They save a piece till their anniversary, they put it in their partner's face, it's fun, whatever they want to do. Often in history, the eldest child would get the first slice. How lucky is that? When it came down to cutting the actual cake too, well, that meant that the bride is no longer a virgin. It's an awkward few bites. Wedding cakes today are delicious and they're pretty much an art form. TV shows are devoted to them, like Cake Boss and other cake shows that I can't think of. If you're lucky, you might find a few cake charms on the inside as well back in the day. Real, non-edible cake charms. You wanted to find these in your cake. They brought good omens to the table. To find a rocking chair meant that you were going to live a long life. An anchor means you're bound for adventure, sailors ahoy. And a purse meant that you would have good fortune. Let's just hope you didn't find the charms with your teeth or else you would be using said new fortune fixing your chiclets. Very metal, very real. <laughs> Not good. At number two, plague flowers. In a lot of weddings, the flowers are very important. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere. Get your Benadryl. But why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece, where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits. But a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little bit darker and a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, people were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. Back then, people believed that smells carried contagion, so people would would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying around a bouquet of stinky stuff like garlic and dill to protect them from catching anything. Over the years, the stinky stuff was replaced with nice smelling flowers, but really, no one cares what's in the bouquet anymore because all people want to do is participate in the wedding hunger games and fight to the death to catch the bouquet at the end of the night. Why? Why are we hurting each other for this? Why? And finally, number one, wedding rings. One ring to rule them all. Perhaps the most important piece of the wedding puzzle, rings. Whenever somebody is about to pop the question, everybody around them always needs to see the ring. Congrats, let me see the ring. Oh my God, is it this, is it this? Egyptian pharaohs first used rings to represent this eternal life. The circle has no beginning or ending. They created this concept that we adore to this day. The center of the ring was also believed to be the gateway to the unknown. Finger just disappears, you're like, what the f these Egyptian Ouroboros rings were the first, a snake eating its own tail, hashtag love. When Greeks came in the picture, they took this tradition, started using copper and iron rings in ceremonies, and the iron rings had a key symbol on them, meaning that the wife now has control of the house. If you like it, then you should have put a key on it. Come medieval times, the ring gets another upgrade. Now we have these precious gems to be added to them. A little bit more glam. Rubies symbolized passion, sapphires symbolized the heavens, and diamonds to show strength, because they were rock hard and obviously you know the rest. Come the 12th century, the Christian church declared marriage as a holy sacrament, so rings were solely used now for that ceremony. That's when the engagement ring came into place. There needed to be another trade or promise that was just as strong as a wedding band. So now there's rings for pretty much everything. At number 10, shaming parades. If you've ever watched Game of Thrones, then you might be familiar with that scene where Cersei gets paraded through the streets of King's Landing while naked, and while someone behind her rang a bell chanting, shame. Ding, 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 shame. You know what I mean? It's kind of a meme, but it's also based on a real medieval tradition called shaming parades. For years, people have loved shaming others. I think it's just human nature at this point. And obviously, back then, they didn't have any social media to use as their preferred method of ripping on someone, so they got creative very creative. Depending on what the accused did, their punishment would vary. But the one thing that stayed constant was them being paraded through the streets for everyone to watch. Specific punishments were given for specific crimes. For example, if a tavern owner served bad beer, then they would be paraded through the street and forced to drink their bad beer. If they were caught stealing a pig, then they would walk through the streets with a dead pig around their neck and a crown made of pig's feet. How regal. People would throw things like glass, rocks, and even dead cats at whoever was being paraded, and it was quite the spectacle. Now, would you rather experience this or being canceled on social media? Let me know. At number nine, bloodletting. Back in the dark ages, medicine just wasn't the greatest. Clearly, I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe. Even their quote unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. 
Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, so I'm not really sure I would trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get, so I don't think people were really complaining too much about their barber Joey down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was the practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent illnesses or diseases, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck out the blood of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I am so glad that we do not do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside my body, thank you. Now before we carry on talking about just how weird things were back in the dark ages, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, maybe think about smashing that subscribe button as well to see more videos like this one. On number 8, day drinking. Day drinking is a thing. You know, when you're with the homies and you pour yourself a glass of sangria and take a walk around the neighborhood in the middle of the afternoon. Not saying I've ever done that. It's usually a once in a blue moon type of deal, but for people in the dark ages, day drinking was an everyday affair. Now, people back then weren't necessarily drinking at all hours of the day just to get plastered and stay plastered. It was actually for health reasons. You see, people tried to avoid drinking the water at all costs over fears of illness because the water just wasn't clean and wasn't safe to drink, so they turned to the next closest thing that they could drink, and that just so happened to be alcohol. Back then, it was common to drink large amounts of beer, cider, or wine, and it was common to be drunk all of the time. Thank God we can safely drink water now because I don't think anyone could handle the hangover that came with all that heavy drinking. At number 7, no pleasure. The Dark Ages were heavily immersed in religion. In medieval Europe, they took Christianity very seriously and people followed the church very closely. The mission of people back then was to live a good Christian life and to not commit any sins, but one of those sins was a little unfortunate when you look back on it. Back then, any sexual acts that were meant for pleasure and not for procreation creation was considered a sin. That meant that sexy time was reserved for furthering the population and that's it. And if you did anything recreational, you would be getting a one way ticket to hell. Along those same lines, it was also believed that female domination was also a sin and so the woman could not get on top, or again, straight to hell with her. One saint, Francesca Romana, was so afraid of experiencing pleasure when she slept with her husband that she literally burned her lady bits with hot fat so that it would make the experience as miserable as possible. That sounds horrible. At number 6, cemetery fun. What types of things do you guys like to do for fun? Do you play video games or read? Or maybe you watch Netflix or YouTube, huh? And where do you like to go for fun? Maybe the mall or to your friend's house? Well, if you lived in the dark ages in Europe, you would go to the place that everyone goes for fun, the cemetery. Yep, you're gonna go kiki it up with the corpses and unfortunately they're not corpse husband, although corpse, if you're watching, hit me up. Thank you. Anyways, back in the dark ages, the cemetery was the place to be. It was considered to be the social hub of the community. Back then, people held theater performances, elections, trials, and even set up businesses in the cemetery because the graveyard shops were exempt from taxes. There was quite a lot going on in the cemetery, but it was almost the equivalent of going to the mall. But I want you guys to tell me if you would ever be like the people in the dark ages and just go to the cemetery for fun. At number 5, an eye for an eye. When it came to the legal process in medieval Europe, things weren't always fair. I mean, they tried women for being witches and prosecuted animals for various crimes. Their punishments were sometimes swift and just, and other times, they weren't. People back then believed that when found guilty of a crime, there were worse punishments than losing a hand or something. As I mentioned a little earlier, they were quite fond of public humiliation, but they also believed in issuing fines and even kicking someone out of the community altogether. If someone was found guilty of a violent crime, then they would be subjected to punishment that would cause them pain as well, but not to teach them a lesson, but rather to brandish them so that they would be recognized as a person in the community who did that one thing to that one person, you know? Since these people were very religious, they also had to make up with God for whatever crime they committed as well, so usually that would involve fasting and then it would be up to Sky Daddy to determine if further punishment was needed. At number 4, The King's Evil. Being a king or queen in the Dark Ages might seem like a pretty cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another, they had to worry about their bloodlines, and of course, the thing that everyone had to deal with 
illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil. And you're probably wondering, well, these kings weren't doctors, how did they cure illness? And to that, I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and they cured them. People thought that this was a miracle and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness because the monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. At number 3, tooth worms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the dark ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only do they not have any proper medication or anesthetics, but you could also get the worst diagnosis your dentist could ever give you, and that was a diagnosis of an infection of tooth worms. They believed that people could be infected with tooth worms that caused a tooth to decay and that pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, is the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to rid the worm would be to take a candle made out of sheep's fat and various seeds, and then they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run from the heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the patient's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number two, judging tears. In modern times, somehow we've come up with this idea that only girls are allowed to cry. I think that's pretty BS and it's healthy for everyone to express their emotions, and funnily enough, they believed the same thing back in the dark ages. Back then, everyone was expected to cry freely, but the strange part of all this is the fact that people judged how others cried. Their tears would be judged on quantity, duration of crying, and frequency as well. They took their tears pretty seriously. Obviously, when someone was crying because of some kind of loss, it was pretty much nothing, but if they saw someone else crying for a different or unexplained reason, this was believed to have been a different kind of tears called the gift of tears. They believed that this was a sign that someone was thinking of Jesus and his suffering, and that they were so overcome with emotion that they were moved to tears, and this was also considered a gift from God. As long as someone's crying wasn't too loud, they didn't cry too much, and it didn't disturb anyone, especially during a church service, they were just considered particularly devout. And finally, at number one, pee readings. This dark age tradition is probably one of the strangest ones I have ever heard, and you might come to think the same thing. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do the practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they could judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color and that meant everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that your wine colored pee is a bad thing. Number 10, bank robberies. Okay, when we hear about the wild, wild, rootin' tootin', wild west, whatever, we think of outlaws like Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch, the James Younger Gang. Apparently, it was just bank robbery central back then. Just a lot of a lot of this and tapping and riding horses and stuff. That's really not true. Bank robberies didn't happen that often in real life. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies. Eight. That many years ago, along 15 western states, there were only eight. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were roughly 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. Much more than eight. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by the famous outlaw Jesse James and his brother Frank. This went down in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. Fun rootin' tootin' history. Number nine, camels. My favorite actor growing up, hands down, was Woody from Toy Story. The guy's physical comedy was on point. And no, I don't mean Tom Hanks. I mean Woody, with this crazy little cowboy run, tipping his hat, 
But what's a cowboy without his horse, right? As soon as Bullseye got introduced in Toy Story 2, the picture was complete. A cowboy and a horse. We've seen this combo at some point in our lives everywhere. But did you know that for around 100 years, camels were part of Texas wildlife? So imagine a cowboy on a camel. Yeah, that's real. That's That happened. Imagine two cowboys on the humps of a camel. How silly and intimidating would that look? Back in 1855, Congress spent thousands to purchase and ship feral camels from Egypt. The hot southwest would make sense when it comes to camels doing their camel thing. But by 1857, the army had 70 camels. Things were going well until, you know, the Civil War happened, and then the camels escaped and all that madness, and then from then on, for 100 years or so, they bred and roamed Texas. Yeehaw, on a camel, how fun. Number eight, cowboys. All right, since we're talking about cowboys, let's really talk about cowboys. Who were these guys? Was everybody just a cowboy off the bat, or did you have to earn it like a knight? What's the deal here? Well, the guys that we picture in our brain, like Woody, those are cattle herders, and then buffalo, thousands of them, they would roam the land to eat and find water. They would travel miles away, so the herders would follow on horseback and then drive them back to the ranch. They mostly ate beans, dried meat, obviously, and a lot of coffee. Those are the three main ingredients of yeeing and hawing. Am I a cowboy? I love beans and coffee. Coffee beans? Huh, don't even get me started. A classic western outfit was the denim jeans and chaps, the leather covers that, you know, go over your legs. The large rim hats were called Stetsons. Aside from looking cool, they were large enough to keep the sun out of your eyes. That hat would also double down as a drinking bowl for their horse. Sharing is caring. Number seven, the Bison Express. Humans are responsible for the disappearance on many, many wild animals in one way or another. It's usually our fault. Yeah, going back to the wild, wild west, the year 1869 specifically, that's when the Pacific Railroad was done. It was open to the west to all these explorers, but now they were whipping across these wild lands in record speed, passing hundreds of bison every single trip. Eventually, it didn't take long for these railroads to advertise hunting excursions on these trains. So yeah, guests would climb aboard the top of the train cars and hunt on the top of the trains. Yeah, on the top, they would just shoot these animals for sport. Obviously, the train couldn't stop and go back for the bodies, so they would just leave them. This one man, Orlando Bond, nicknamed The Brick, okay, he apparently shot thousands himself. He rode the express so many times his rifle caused him to go deaf in one ear. This was done purposely to deprive Native Americans of their food supply. Now our bison's number are incredibly low, something like 2% of what it once was, and humans, well, we're still pretty garbage. What do you know? Number six, alcohol. These saloons cowboys would visit, was there a bouncer? Did you need two pieces of ID? What was the drinking age back then? Well, besides the swinging saloon doors, it really wasn't a fun time at all. Alcohol back then, first of all, was basically just poison. Actually, it was literally poison sometimes. They had whiskey like 40 rods and Tao's lightning. You have a couple of those and you're literally passing out in minutes. Nobody was getting cut off in old timey saloons. The bartender wasn't like, hey, how about a water, buddy? Let's get you home. No, it was show. They had this one drink on bar rail called Tarantula Juice. Yeah, happy 21st birthday. Go throw up. It was made from strychnine, which was actual poison. So when the whiskey wore off, the strychnine would be left over in the patron's body, and it felt like tarantulas were crawling all over your skin. Ugh. Yeah, I'm good with a Bud Light Lime. Thanks, man. Number five, the gold rush. Picture a billboard for the wild, wild west, okay? What's on it right now? A cowboy tipping his hat in the corner with you know four missing teeth, a sunset in the corner obviously, maybe a horse, and also a bunch of gold stacked up in a mine, right? Well, we've heard about the Wild West here and there, but was there really a massive gold rush? The California Gold Rush of 1849, despite what history commonly believes, wasn't the first big gold rush, not even close. The first one was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock right on his property. He had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, used this rock as a door stopper. You already know where I'm going with this. This 17 pound nugget of gold, which is worth a lot even today, back then this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right after. Then later in 1828, more gold was discovered, but this time in Georgia. This was the second rush. Then come 1848, James Marshall found gold at Sutter's Mill, California. After the third one though, that's when the thousands moved out west. That one had the biggest pull. So. It's pretty big, but not the first. Number four, the OK Corral. The shootout at the OK Corral went down on October 26th, 1881. It's known as the most famous shootout in history. But should it be, really? 
Going back to Tombstone, Arizona, it's 3 p.m. and we have men of the law and of course outlaws all the same block. So naturally, trouble ensues. There's not enough land here for all of us, some rootin' tootin' sh There were about eight men involved in the rumble, but it barely lasted 30 seconds. Also, it's important to note the gunfight at the OK Corral wasn't even at the OK Corral. It happened near the intersection of 3rd Street and Fremont Street, right behind the corral. Yeah, details matter. Three lawmen were injured and three cowboys lost their lives. Yeehaw. That was a sad yeehaw for you guys. This is why you don't organize shootouts at 3 p.m. I don't know, everyone's drunk, there's bad decisions, apparently there's bad aim. Just slam some milk, shake some hands, go home. Simple. Number three, Helena Duels. So we talked about the bizarre ways folks would settle beef back then. They would slam tarantula juice and shoot animals from the top of locomotives, have a 30 second fist fight in the middle of the day and then go home. But have you heard of these Helena duels? It began, of course, in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth, at least it was back in the 1800s. The Helena duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They show this style of combat in a pretty brutal, Hollywood way. Both opponents had their left hands tied together with buckskin and then each were given a small knife with an even smaller blade. It had to be short enough so it didn't reach any vital organ. That was the Texas trick. Then they're whirled around until they're dizzy and then it gets really loud, really messy and really bloody. Last man standing, pretty much. The crowd of course watches and places bets which is always insane to me. I can't watch UFC sometimes. I don't like seeing things break, let alone a hell in a duel. Catch me inside sipping milk, texting my ex. Hard pass, freaks. Number two, train games. Entertainment was always a hit or miss when it comes to these historical lists. The Romans held gladiator battles with animals that drew in thousands of spectators from across the land. Well, in 1894, William Crush, a railway man, had this event in mind that would for sure go down in history. Oh buddy, did it ever. William Crush wanted to secure the future of the railroad company in Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. And to do so, William made an entire temporary city appropriately named the city of Crush. Nice. There was a carnival for children to enjoy and all that jazz, but the main pull for adults was the train smash. The collision of two 40 ton steam trains was meant to be the talk of the town. Look at these goliaths as they smash, or I mean crush, haha, <laughs> into each other. How fun. Yeah, the trains collided, it worked, and the darnest thing happened, um, they blew up. Yeah, it's almost like they caused a disaster for popularity, neat. 40,000 came in and many left injured. A couple of people sadly didn't leave at all. One survivor ended up getting 10 grand out of the deal. His name was JC Dean and they lost their eye in the explosion. So the company gave them a lifetime railway pass. Just the thing you want right after that horrific event. Sorry about your eye. Here's free PTSD as well. Anytime you want, enjoy. Crush was later rehired by the railway after it gained popularity. Yeah, this it happened back then too. Somebody does something horrible and then now all of a sudden they're famous. Hashtag chair girl. And finally coming in at number one, Elmer McCurdy. This one is insane. I had to end with it. Elmer McCurdy back in 1911, he decided to be a rootin' tootin' criminal and he attempted to rob a train. Unbeknownst to him, that train was not full of gold, but rather passengers. Collecting a whopping $46, which back then was still pretty good, he was quickly shot by a lawman afterwards. This is where things start to get insane. Yeah, I say start. Elmer's body was embalmed and sold by The Undertaker to this traveling carnival. His body was an exhibit almost, with his story attached. And for the next 60 years, his body, this prop rather, was passed around, sold between haunted houses and wax museums. Eventually the guy's body, his real body, don't forget, ends up in California at an amusement park funhouse at Long Beach. Now, come 1976, there's a crew there filming for the $6 million man show, and that's when Elmer's finger breaks off accidentally. Some key grips like, whoops, revealing it was an actual mummy. Kicking off the list at number 10, together at last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrews fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. 
Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird. Go home. Relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was going to happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches. Just saying. 
At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the Night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go Go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Bree mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks, Abe. Good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine, like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, Witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment, because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, 
Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Number 10. Steel cage match, brother. Okay, so it's the early 1900s and you're living in a rapidly growing city. Towers are popping up everywhere, and that means that there's less space for you and your baby to play in. Only if there was a way my baby could get fresh air and sunshine. Meet the baby cage. Yeah, a small metal cage with a tiny mattress for your baby. The said metal cage is suspended on your windowsill, making the baby spend multiple stories above ground level. This, this is just a great idea. The idea behind this terrible idea was that the babies need fresh air and sunshine. Providing them with such was thought to improve their immune system and make them healthier. Besides the fact that the only thing separating your baby from becoming the worst rainfall event of the month was a thin metal cage. This is a prime example of why every product should be thoroughly tested and thought about before selling. Eventually, these did fall out of fashion, but in reality this wasn't that long ago, which is kind of crazy to think about. Number 9. Nuclear Time A lot happened in the 1900s. I mean, a lot. Couple wars here and there, the TV, the car, it was a busy century. A century full of discovery and invention. One such unusual invention was the radium dial, watches and clocks that were painted with luminescent paint, making the numbers and dials glow in the dark. Trouble with this new invention was the paint being used wasn't exactly safe, as it was made from radium. For the Breaking Bad nerds at home, radium is a highly radioactive element even more so than the legendary uranium. So when a factory of women eager to get to work were told they were going to be painting watches with radioactive paint, do you think anyone asked for PPE? Truth be told, not everything was known about radium as it was only recently discovered, but what's so unusual is what factories told these women how to paint the watches. In order to give the brushes a fine tip, the women were instructed to use their lips to keep the brushes in perfect order, not knowing that day after day they were ingesting a very radioactive element. And in some sense of dark comedy, they sometimes had fun and painted their nails and on each other. I mean, it glowed in the dark, it was glow in the dark paint, it was new, it was cool. Over 50 women would become very sick from painting, and 12 sadly lost their lives. Number 8. I'm ready for my close up. Ladies, this one's for you. In this day and age with social media, loving your self image can be tough. There's tons of things that makeup companies and media do to make you want to be the people they want you to be. If you buy said product, of course. Well, I'm here to tell you that you don't need all that. You're gorgeous just the way you are, and lately, honey, you've been slaying it. However, this marketing manipulation isn't new, and in the past, most certainly wasn't very subtle. Introducing the Beauty Micrometer, the latest from How to Horrify People Daily. It was actually invented by the famed beautician Max Factor Sr. Hell of a name. This steel cagey device was placed over a poor woman's head to then mathematically calculate the flaws that would be adjusted using makeup products. Obviously, these are no longer around and for good reason. I, I, I don't even have a joke for that one. That's just weird. Number 7. Back to the Future During the technological boom of electronics in the 1980s, there was one invention I think is really unusual. Computers, camcorders, and even home video game consoles were becoming commonplace all over the world. People who are familiar with retro Nintendo consoles are familiar with the likes of Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda, or Contra. You may even remember a certain gaming accessory involving a laughing dog every time you miss a duck. What 80s kids might not remember is the Konami Laser Scope. Similar to Nintendo's Zapper, but with two key differences. One, it's a headset instead of a pistol. Two, it's voice controlled, meaning when you come across enemies in game, you have to shout fire to fire in game. The Konami laser scope was bold and tried to be ahead of its time, but when taking a good look at it, one, it makes the user just look ridiculous, and two, it doesn't work. Reviews for the headset are not favorable and just defeat the purpose of using a headset. Today we have VR headsets that may seem just as ridiculous, 
but they work, and the use of voice still isn't a primary control used in games today. Number 6. Battleship Woodchip. This is one of my favorites. Okay, hear me out for this one. Back in the 1940s, there was a really super, not very fun, expensive war happening. Germany, Japan, and Italy needed to go into the timeout corner. But after a while of people trying to put each other in the timeout corner, things were getting super expensive. World War II was fought on all fronts, land, sea, and air. The sea being a key part of the war victory in the beginning of the war. Literally tons of war goods and ships were being sunk by German U-boats every day across the Atlantic. So in order to cut costs, what if the ships were built out of something cheaper, but just as tough as steel? Concrete, right? Nope, I bet you weren't thinking ice. Or more specifically, sawdust and ice mixed to form piecrete. Testing with piecrete had gone so well that in a super secret general meeting, piecrete was presented, shot at in the meeting, ricocheting a bullet causing another general a flesh wound. Having its defense capabilities proven in the war room, Operation Habakkuk was greenlit and the Allies were planning on constructing an aircraft carrier made out of ice and sawdust to help thwart the German U-boats. However, this was scrapped as a boat made of sawdust and ice would really not be much help against a German U-boat. Plus, where do you sleep? Can you cook on there? Way more questions than answers. Number 5. Hello there. Channeling our inner General Grievous, our number 5 spot belongs to the monowheel. Originally designed in the 19th century, it wasn't until the 20th century they slapped a motor on one of these bad boys and did their best escape attempt from Utapau. Sorry, I'm a Star Wars guy. It just looks like the vehicle from the third movie, I can't help myself. In reality, the monocycle is a single wheeled motorized vehicle where the driver either sits inside the wheel housing or right beside it. Today these vehicles are still around but really only used for entertainment purposes, as the design does have a few issues. One wheel gives balance issues, there's a visibility issue since, well, you know, you're usually sitting inside the wheel, and an issue called gerbling, which basically means if the driver brakes too hard, the inner ring will overcome its own gravity and the driver will do a full loop, similar to how a gerbil spins around on its wheel. Seeing that would make Monday morning traffic a lot more amusing though, I gotta say. Number 4. Deep breath, my equine friend. World War I was the war to end all wars, except for the 10 major wars that came after it. Noted for being the bloodiest and most destructive conflict at the time, it gave humanity a bunch of cool and exciting inventions, so long as they were not being used on you. One of the worst things to come out of the First World War was the extensive use of trench warfare and chemical weapons, or more specifically chlorine gas. Trench warfare was brutal, not only in its barbaric over the top charges into machine gun fire, but also in its living. Trenches had terrible living conditions, and were difficult to take from the enemy. Crossing no man's land was no joke. So to eliminate the pesky enemies entrenched in their trenches, the very cruel chlorine gas was used, causing nausea, violent coughing, chest pain, and corneal burns, just about everything you'd find on the back of normal medication, right? Gas masks helped when they were available, but unfortunately they were not the only living creatures on the battlefield. This is where our invention comes in. The very depressing invention of the horse gas mask. The idea is the same. Horses need protection too, and since World War I was still a war powered by horses, it was more common than you might think. And a lot of our equine friends perished alongside us. Number 3. Wilson! Some of you may have been cool enough back in 1975 to own a pet rock. Some of you may have not. Looking back, it doesn't really make any sense. Sure, everyone needs something to keep them company. Tom Hanks would have never gotten off the island he was stranded on if it wasn't for Wilson. Imagine a world without Tom Hanks. I, for one, would not want to live in such a world. All jokes aside, the Pet Rock was a genius marketing campaign, very similar to the fidget spinner of recent years. It's proof that if you can get a fad trade rolling, you can sell anything. Now who wants some of my bath water? Number 2. Chef's Kiss Okay, it's 1958. Times are good. Cars have cool fins on them, Elvis is on the radio, and most of my post-traumatic stress disorder has cleared up since the war was over. It's all great. Ah yes, life is good. I can't wait to enjoy some modern cuisine. Well, let's see what's on the menu. I'll have to start with the frozen cheese salad. I'll have ham and banana hollandaise. And for dessert, I'll have the lime jello tuna pie. If that doesn't sound appetizing, I don't know what does. For some reason, halfway through the century, people just lost their taste buds. They were coming up with all kinds of disgusting foods. A lot of them are in low form for some strange reason. I think the grossest item that you can come across is a little invention called Hongar. Sounds like somebody from Skyrim, but nay good sir. Hongar is a mixture of honey and apple cider vinegar. It was thought to provide great health benefits. 
The only thing that would give me is a spot in front of the toilet refunding my breakfast. Ugh. Number one, Krümelauf. Germany was having a really hard time in World War II. The United States, Canada, Britain, Australia, France, and Russia too were all coming to give the mustache man a piece of their mind. Heavily outnumbered, it was time for a miracle. Time to see what top German scientists had up their sleeve. We have a rifle that can shoot around the corners. Isn't it wunderbar? Yeah, this thing is real. A curved barrel called a Krumlauf, used for shooting around tight spaces like corners and out of tank hatches. During the waning years of the war, Germany was coming up with all kinds of crazy inventions to turn the tide. But a rifle that can shoot around corners probably isn't the answer. As mentioned above, the world was coming and they needed a lot more than a fancy pants rifle to stop the allies. History tells us that this invention did not work as mustache man. No calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7-Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? <laughs> no way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm getting a little lonely. Number 9. Act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind. Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was, especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together. But given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. 
Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five. Big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no. Commonly called self-pollution. Which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just as long as the bedroom door is closed, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Cause with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did, and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that, but squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself, and I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad. So a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, I'm not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching, so sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled. Reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, 
or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms. But that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Cause I never ten creation. Every religion and civilization from the dawn of humanity has come up with their own unique stories as to how the world was created. Some civilizations have credited aliens, others have credited a benevolent god, and many of these gods have their own unique ways of creating life. Though we've heard stories of gods creating people out of things like corn or mud or just thin air, I don't think these stories could even compare to the ancient Egyptian story of creation. These ancient people believed that their very first god, Atum, created himself. As such, he had no wife and literally no one else to potentially procreate with, and so to create his and thus create humanity, he, well, he busted Literally. He just gave himself a one to meat massage and boom. Out of that process, he created his kids Shu and Tefnut. A very fitting name, if you ask me. This legend, I guess you could say, created the term the god's hand. And this was used to refer to women back in ancient Egypt, since Atum's hand played the quote unquote female role in the creation of his offspring. This term was also carried over into other civilizations, like in the Greco Roman period, so if you ever hear someone say god's hand, now you know where that came from. At number nine, cheating death. These days, if you get caught cheating on your partner, the worst that could happen to you is you break up, or you get a divorce, or maybe even get exposed on social media. But back in the times of ancient Egypt, the punishment for adultery was much, much worse than having your relationship end. Instead, your life would be the thing that ends. Obviously, in any civilization, any kind of relationship can always happen outside of a marriage. The only varying difference is the punishment for it. For the ancient Egyptians, being caught having an adulterous relationship was punishable by death. Pretty harsh for having a sneaky link, but I guess they took their relationships much more seriously back then. One of the most famous cases of a serial adulterer, if you will, came from a man named Peneb, who was known to sleep with many married women and even had his own son join in on his escapades too. As you can imagine, things didn't really end well for them, so if you ever go back in time to ancient Egypt, just be careful of who you sleep with. Before we continue talking about some of the things that your teachers might not have taught you about ancient Egypt, why not leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Ancient WAP. Last year, there was a huge scandal concerning Cardi B and Meg Thee Stallion's song WAP. It's a pretty racy song that had a lot of people up in arms about it, and it was all over the news. I mean, if you ever heard any songs from the early 2000s, then you would know that this kind of musical content really isn't a new thing, and little songs have been a part of society for a really long time, but it might surprise you to know that they even had some risque songs even back in the times of ancient Egypt. Historians have discovered some of these songs, one of which I can recite to you, and it uses some pretty imaginative wording to describe a woman's body. In an excerpt from said song, it says, quote, the one, the sister without peer, the handsomest of all. She looks like the rising morning star. At the start of a happy year, shining bright, fair of skin, lovely the look of her eyes, sweet the speech of her lips, she has not a word too much. Upright neck, shining breast, her hair true lapis lazuli, arms surpassing gold, fingers like lotus buds, heavy thighs, and narrow waist, her legs parade her beauty. With graceful steps she treads the ground, captures my heart with her movement." End quote. Now, it's no WAP, but for the ancient Egyptians, it was pretty spicy. At number 7, the ancient hub. Back in ancient times, people needed some spicy content to make themselves happy, you know? Before we had only fans and the hub, people in ancient Egypt had their own adult content to enjoy during their alone time. This piece of content was called the Turin Papyrus, and it was essentially just a scroll of a bunch of images on it with people getting busy in some frankly unimaginable positions. Like, I don't know when the Kama Sutra was created, but I feel like the Turin Papyrus certainly gave it a run for its money. The purpose of this papyrus is pretty much unknown, but there are some theories to explain its origin and why it was created, some thinking that it had political ties or something. Either way, historians use this document to further understand times in ancient Egypt. At number 6, Magic Attraction. You know, we can't always have the best game when it comes to finding a partner. Sometimes it can be hard to get someone to go out with you. Many people just don't give up until they succeed, and sometimes that means that they will go to many lengths just to get a date with their crush. 
This was seen a lot in ancient Egypt, and at one point in later years of their civilization, they practiced magic to attract the one that they loved. Turns out that they practiced voodoo to get someone interested in them, and it was commonly done by men seeking out the woman of their dreams. In one case of this voodoo for love practice, a man had a magician make a voodoo doll of a woman that he wanted all to himself. The magician pierced the figurine with bronze nails and inscribed a tablet on it with a spell saying that this woman would not be able to drink, eat, or be with another man besides the one seeking her out. The spell also supposedly summoned a demon to follow her and pull her hair and intestines until she found her way to him. Sounds a little intense, but hey, I guess that's just what you do when you don't have Tinder. At number five, Sneaky Link. In ancient Egyptian literature, women were often portrayed as seductresses. One of the more famous stories telling the tale of a seductress is one called the Tale of the Two Brothers. Essentially, the story goes that a man, his wife, and his younger brother all lived together. One day, the two men went out to do some farm work, and while they were out, the one man told his brother to go back to the house to get some grain sacks. When he reached the house, the wife noticed the brother and complimented him on his strength and tried to seduce him. The brother got angry and refused, but told the wife that he wouldn't say anything to her husband about their encounter. Still, she was worried that the brother would snitch, and so she made herself look like she had been beaten up, and when her husband returned, she pretended like the brother was the one who tried to seduce her. The husband got angry and threatened to kill his brother, but in an attempt to save his own skin, the brother told the husband the truth and even cut his bits off and threw his pee pee into the river just to prove his point, where it was promptly eaten by fish. Unfortunate. The husband then returned home to his wife, where he killed her and fed her to dogs. Not a happy ending for anyone, but it gives you a real sense of how adultery worked back in those days. At number 4, no Viagra. Just like anyone else these days, back in ancient Egypt, sometimes people had performance issues. Impotence was apparently a really big issue for many Egyptian men. It was such a common issue that sometimes it infiltrated their art and there were some scrolls and statues about it. An ancient Egyptian proverb was created about such a topic that said, quote, He who is shy to have intercourse with his wife will not get any children. Now obviously, there are things nowadays that can help with such an issue, but back then, people resulted to prayer and magic to help their little buddies out. Don't really know how well that worked out for them, but it's a struggle that a lot of people face, so at least they weren't alone. At number 3, LGBTQ+. As with anywhere on earth, there were same-sex relationships, and the same goes for ancient Egypt. However, documentation of such things were far and few. The only 100% clear-cut case of same-sex relationships that was documented in ancient Egypt comes from the story of Horus and Seth. The story goes that Horus and Seth were both vying for the throne, and one night, Horus pretended to be drunk while Seth tried to take advantage of him while Horus slept. Not the greatest example, but it's what we've got that's actually confirmed. Another potential recorded gay relationship may have come from Egypt's King Pepu II, who was thought to have had a secret relationship with one of his generals at nighttime. One of the most well known potential gay relationships from those times, though, comes from a piece of Egyptian art that showed two men touching noses. Doesn't seem like anything too intimate, but back then, touching noses was another way of kissing. The two men depicted, though, were thought to be brothers, so it's theorized that there was something a little spicy going on there, but we don't have to think about that one too hard. At number two, dirty insults. What is your favorite insult? Don't be shy, you can tell me, this is a safe space. I guess I have a number of favorites, but one that I quite enjoy is saying that someone's mother is a horker, like in Skyrim. Back in the times of ancient Egypt, however, insults often included some kind of note. If they needed to hurl an insult at someone, they might say something like, quote, may you copulate with a donkey, or may a donkey copulate with your wife. People would also combine some kind of note with pointing out someone's flaws to create an insult. In a note found from one of the people who built one of the great pyramids, they insulted one of their co-builders by saying, quote, you are not a man because you cannot get your wives pregnant like your fellow men. Like, damn, that's pretty cold, dude. And finally, at number one, the magic pee pee. <laughs> Now, I had to save this next fact for our number one spot because it's probably one of the most bizarre things that I've ever learned about ancient Egypt. The Egyptian god Min was the male fertility god, and let's just say that he was quite unique. He was known for his bold feathered headdress and the fact that his loincloth snake was always being charmed, if you get what I'm saying. Men suffering from impotence would make offerings to him to help them with their fertility problems. Even to this day, figures of the god Min are used in magic rites. Men and women still visit the ancient temples to find figures of the god and literally rub his 
to overcome their problems. Sounds strange, but apparently so many people have done it that the stone that it's carved into has become worn down or darkened from how many hands have touched it. Now I can only imagine what this god's body count was.